You know, sometimes you got to do a walk of shame. <laughs> sometimes you got to do a walk of shame. What was the fucking CPI, dude? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it good? Was it bad? Um, how bad is it? How bad? Was it okay that I slept through it? Yes, I slept through it, dude. I slept through it. I'll talk about why I slept through it. I fucking slept through it, dude. I was I was so tired. Uh, you know, it's funny. I woke up at like uh, 7.30 and I was ready to go. Let's shut my eyes for like one more second. And um, yeah, this thing, this thing, I, I, I fell back asleep. <laughs> How bad is it? I have not even looked at the market, dude. I have literally not even looked at the market. Um, is it that bad? Dude, I don't even, I don't even want to check Twitter. The messages must be crazy. This must be, yep, there you go. <laughs> There's so many messages. <laughs> oh boy, how 3.5? Holy shit. I don't even want to look at it, dude. I don't even want to be looking at it. Oh my god. Oh man. So what happened last night, guys, is I had a lot of work to do. And so I stayed up during the night and I finished a ton of work and uh, I slept at like 4 a.m. And then I was ready. I woke up back at 7:30. I was ready to go. And then I took one more little like shut eye and <laughs> dude, this is the craziest thing dude i titled it the most important day in the history of the planet earth oh my god i'm so sorry yes i'm fine i'm good guys i'm good you know it is what it is sometimes you got to uh take the walk of shame and 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 deal with it i will say though uh i just woke up from one of the best dreams i've ever had in my life i i'm going to talk about that on on another day but you know, it is. It, it does suck that I missed this the the CPI, but goodness, that dream was so damn good. And I think part of the reasons I couldn't wake up is because that dream was so good. Like I, it was so hard to wake up out of that dream. Nonetheless, I'm here. Um, all right, I'm looking at the market for the first time. So this is a first on the market open. I am literally waking up, and you see my hair, right? My hair is crazy. Everything. I am literally looking at the market open for the first time, or for the for the. Um, I'm looking at the uh the charts for the first time here we go i'm looking at i'm looking at with you guys together oh my god it i it doesn't even want to look at this and oh my god s p is down 1.37 percent oh boy robin it's down four <laughs> percent <the> oh <laughs> yo this is wild dude oh my god sofi's down three percent as a this destiny stupid ETFs down 21%, Tesla's down to Tesla actually still at 173 is pretty damn amazing. Yeah, I gotta say. NVIDIA 837. That it was actually out there yesterday. So we still have 25 minutes till the market opens. Um Reddit is down 1.3%. ARM is down 2.4%. Boeing down 0.95. Reddit down 1.87. Okay, so the SP is down 1.35%. That's not that crazy. I mean, that's bad, but like. It's not that bad, right? It's not that bad. Robin, this is a fucking dip that I think people should. I mean, we'll see where it ends up. I don't know if it's going to last down at 1766 for that long. Where's Pounder? How bad is Pounder? Pounder is below 21. 2211. That, you know, the fact that it's actually holding 22 is not that crazy either, dude. It's not that crazy. I mean, we'll see when, the, when it opens, it's going to get bloody, but I think there's actually going to be a little bit of buying the dip when this happens. It's not going to be that crazy. We'll see. We'll see when it opens and we'll figure it out. Um, but we'll keep we'll keep going from there. Okay, I'll get back into it. For those that are just joining, again, I am very, very sorry. I stayed up. Let me just show you my tweets last night. I was up all night finishing work. Dude. This is one of those nights where I was like, yo, I'm going to stay up and I'm just going to get work done. And I thought I was going to stay up super late and I'll be fine, which I usually am. Like, I, I have not slept through a market open in two years, dude. I, don't, I usually don't sleep through this stuff. Uh, so it was a crazy night, dude. So... Uh, Chris, I'm sending you the link right now. We'll talk about it in a second. This is what happened last night, dude. I was up, right? I was up. I was up at 11 p.m., 12.30, 1.30. Then 2.30, I get a text message, dude. And this thing probably fucked up. This thing this thing probably you know, made me sleep longer. This girl I used to talk to from years ago sends me this audio message. And that shit just, I did not expect that, right? It's like this five-minute message, and, and she saw the Vlad interview. And she's like, you know, you told me to chase my dreams four years ago, and I didn't listen. But I'm so happy you're chasing yours. 
And I just did not expect to get that message. And so, and then we start talking in the night and then, you know, I end up staying up a little longer. And then at four 30, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to go to sleep. But this is the stuff that happens when you stay up all night. And then I wake up by seven 30. And then when it's time to wake up for the fucking CPI, Chris, I'm sending you the link right now on Twitter. Um, I just, I can't, I, 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 I fall asleep. So it was a, it was a night that I didn't ex expect to happen like that. But yeah, your ass, my ass, my ass fell, fell asleep. It was weird though, bro. It was weird. I was like, I did not, that message threw me off guard. I was like, why is she sending this shit? Like why is 2 AM what's going on right now? So it is what it is. But anyway, I'm very sorry for that. Some, you, you know, what are you going to do? Sometimes you just fall asleep and this is the first time I've done it in three years for the market open. So, uh, we will always have this memento as a, as a walk of uh, shame for the market open. I'll be longer. I'll stay longer for this one. So we analyze this. Chris will be joining. So we'll get some analysis from him and uh, blame it on a girl. Yeah, dude. And it's all, it's always their fault. It's always their fault. So this is, this is what we got to do. This is what we got to do. It's literally always there. It was not Courtney, dude. It was not Courtney. Apology not accepted. I'll stay longer here and I'll stay longer on the market close today. Oh my God, dude. The thing is, dude, with this girl, I used to talk to her a lot, dude. Like a couple years ago, fucking we'd be FaceTiming seven hours a day and shit. You know what I mean? Like, like legit. So when, when she came out of nowhere and Chris, I sent you it on Twitter, by the way, when she came out of nowhere, she was like, you know, you told me to chase my dreams and I never did it. But now, you know, I'm so happy you're chasing yours. And you sent me this long ass message. I was like, what the fuck is this dude? What's going on here? The fuck is going on? <laughs> Why is this happening at 2 a.m.? Uh, Julian, I just got your message. He says the market is as red as your sleepy eyes. Oh man, you know, but but, but see, but see, this kind of influenced uh, the dream I had before I woke up, and it was a, it was a phenomenal dream. So anyway, uh, all right, pound you down three percent. Chris should be joining in just a second, um, and uh, and he'll give us some analysis here. This is a bad CPI. This is a bad bad CPI. You think the market bounces after open? You know what? I think so. I think, look, it's a, it's, it seems like a very big reaction to this idea that we're not going to get rate cuts. Oh, what is the CPI? Let me pull up the freaking CPI, dude. I haven't even pulled it up. CPI. Okay. So this is the actual CPI. How bad is it? Um, 3.5. Okay. So the market wanted 3.4. What was the core? What was the core? Let me, let me see. Let's see. Let's see. How bad is it? Three cores, 3.8. Okay. That's actually that that's not, that's in line. It, at least it's not 3.9. If that was 3.9. Oh my God, dude, that'd be bad. If that was 3.9. We would be, we would be, we would be so bad. Uh, admit this was expected. Many people wanted 3.9. Well, see 3.5 is not crazy, but the thing is every fucking bank said 3.4. So that's none of the banks thought 3.5, and that's why I think the market's reacting. However, I agree. I do think it's uh, the market will bounce on top of that because I don't think that uh, I don't think that that's going to stay. I don't think the market's going to think rate cuts are going to leave because of that. Like, does the market think rate cuts are gone because we got 3.5? Is that like is that is that what's? I don't think that's what's happening. Food index rose 0.1 percent. Food at home was unchanged, while the food away from home rose 0.3. Uh, food and energy. Where's shelter? So shelter. Where's shelter at? What do we have there? Let's see. Shelter. Uh, shelter rose in March, as did gas. Combined, these two indices contributed over half of the monthly increase in all the items. Wow. So shelter and gas were over half of everything. The energy index rose 1.1%. Food rose 0 0.1%. Um, okay. So shelter and gas added a lot. Used cars and vehicles. Wow. That was positive as well. That was big. Or March 20, or actually that, that one decreased a little bit. Used cars, negative 1.1. So that decreased a little bit, but still wasn't as low as we wanted it to be. Um, are you buying more hood? I want to see where it, where it shows up, dude, in the, in the pre-markets on this. I, I don't think it's, look, I'll go out there right now and I'll say, I don't think this dip is going to be so dramatic that it's like one of those days that like we all. We look at this dip and we're just all sad. I think it'll be a dip, but I I think it's going to get eaten up, dude. 3.5 is not the craziest in the world. Now, the problem is if the market in the next 20 minutes starts pricing in, wait a second, it's 3.5 and it's not going to get any better, meaning uh, it's going to take a while to get back down to three. The last time we had 3.5 was 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 like er, like late 2023, right? So if we just reverse seven months of, of work and the market thinks a rate cut's not coming uh, this year, then we're screwed, right? If the market thinks a rate cut's not coming this year. Um, 
but and then the market will start pricing that in and every equity will go down and then it's not worth buying the dip because you're gonna have a lot of dip that you're gonna have to be able to buy but you know but if if if, if that dip ends up clearing up because the market says well it's just a temporary bubble or temporary little hiccup then that's okay where's bitcoin in this is bitcoin down because of this wow fucking bitcoin down two percent holy crap holy crap bitcoin is down two percent right now um yeah that's that's oh boy you know some people were arguing that bitcoin would go higher if um you know bitcoin would go higher if if inflation was higher than expected because it would indicate that there would be more of a liquidity issue the problem is whenever people say okay bitcoin's gonna go higher if there's a liquidity issue and you know we're gonna have more inflation and like that's a hedge is that bitcoin thrives with more Bitcoin thrives in a more risk on environment and to be more risk on people need to have more disposable income, more assets, more, you know, like a reasoning to invest. And that reasoning does not come from inflation being high because then they get scared to invest. And so Bitcoin, it, it performs with the NASDAQ, dude. It's not a fucking like pseudo hedge. It needs rates to go down for people to have more money, but that money does not, that money does not necessarily uh, be, the money's not there if Bitcoin, or if, if interest rates are high. Right, if higher for longer still is a thing. Micro strategy down about four point six percent. You know it's bad. Uh, AMD down two point six eight percent, but it's not that crazy. Celsius down three percent. Like everything's down about two to five percent. Which okay, that's bad. SMCI down five percent. Like got it. But there are plenty of people that want to buy SMCI. I mean, there are plenty and plenty of people that want to buy Palantir below twenty two dollars. Robinhood. I think there's going to be plenty of people that want to buy this sucker at um at seventeen, right? Robin right now, 1758 down 3.96 percent. Could this thing go to 16? Sure. Uh, could it rebound pretty aggressively at 1730? I also think that's very possible. Uh, IWM, that one definitely getting hit $200 down 2.39 percent. So we are seeing some weakness there. Um, Soundhound down 12 percent. Yeah. And we'll see how it happens when the market opens. Chris, why didn't you call me and wake me up? I called you like three times, dude. Don't even. Don't even. <laughs> this, dude, you did. Did you say I'm finding junkies? You're my big brother. How'd you? Why'd you let me down? How's, how's this happening? I don't know, bro. I don't know. <laughs> you know. All right. Um, how fucked are we? How bad was this? Actually, it wasn't that bad. I, I think a lot of people are going to freak out over this. Um, rates are going to get pushed back, all that nonsense. Um, I don't think so. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things, a couple of reasons why. Number one, um, the number that came up is very, very small over over the previous amount. And already we're already seeing April's numbers actually come in lower. So we had a small blip this month. I think it's good. This will probably shake out a lot of weak hands. I think the key here is going to be shelter, though. See, I think you have to be a little bit counterintuitive with this. Um, and hopefully the Fed realizes this, that one of the main causes of inflation right now is the high price of shelter. Um, the thing is, though, if you look at certain sub markets, I'm starting to see inventory rise pretty precipitously, and I'm actually starting to see price cuts. Now, the thing is that data is not going to show up right away. It's going to show up, you know, with a lag. Um, so I think towards the end of the year, we'll, we'll see rates, we'll see um, inflation come down to the Fed's target. So right now, all the stuff that we're seeing today, I'd say take it with a grain of salt. I'm not particularly buying anything because I don't know when the bottoming is going to happen, but I'm also not going to be selling anything. Right now, I, told, I think we discussed it a couple of days ago. The best thing to do in this case is just, you know, weather the storm a little bit. There's going to be a lot of sideways choppiness where... One month things are gonna get bad, and then another month things are gonna get good. Keep an eye on keep an eye on some great companies. Um, but I do think that we are gonna get cuts at the end of this year. That narrative is not broken for me. Um, and I think it'll probably we might have like a flip probably in the summer when the sentiment changes, you know. The whole March thing though, when people were saying that we were gonna get nine cuts or what is it, seven cuts? Yeah. Those people were just hopelessly delusional, you know, so I think delusion has got into reality now. And now people are overcorrecting and saying, oh, we're not going to get any cuts this year. We might have to wait until 2025. And I'm like, 
yeah, this is typically what happens. You've got the pendulum swinging in each direction. So, so do you think the market buys this dip? Because as you said, if you think rate cuts are coming, it's a hell of a dip to buy. Um, or do you think the market says, let's give it a little bit of time to bottom out, which might be a couple months of a little pain before they really get deeper into it? I think it depends on what money you are. If you're dumb money, you'll be selling. If you're smart money, you will be holding. And if you're extremely dumb money, then I don't know what you're going to be doing. But I'd say dumb money right now is likely going to be selling. I would not sell. I would just hold. Right now is not a time where you want to sell and, and go into cash or anything right now. So just, just be patient. But I also wouldn't be buying anything because everything, for the most part, is trading at the top of its valuation ranges. You know, so the broader market, I'm sure that there are deals and opportunities out there, but in terms of like broad market, broad market is somewhat, you know, I would say either fairly valued or extremely uh, highly valued. So. Why do you think uh, uh, dumb money is selling? Because, because, because you think that rate cuts eventually are coming. So this would be like a stupid thing to do. Yeah. Dumb money does, does that. Dumb money reacts to news like this without using some logic. You know, that's why. So. Okay. Now, I, I would tend to agree with you. I think selling here is weird. I mean, the sell happens when you think, and even then it's a weird sell. If you if we've had like three, four months of this happen where it's just really bad and uh, it's it, you don't see any coming further from there. But if this is a temporary blip and we're still going to get a rate cut, this is actually a very awesome dip. And uh, you know, we've seen what's really unique is every time the market is dipped on a hot CPI, which we've had three of them today, January and February, uh, at least on January and February, that morning, January, like five minutes later, the market bought the dip. February, about an hour later, the market bought the dip. Today, it'll be really interesting to see how long does the market actually take to buy the dip or does the market, uh, you know, let the pain kind of flow out. But if it happens today, then it'll be really funny for the bears that are arguing that, you know, this is the end of the world. Um, do you think the bears are going to try to claim victory here that the Fed will hike? And do you think they have an argument for that? I mean, they'll try, but the Fed is not going to hike anymore. They already know core is still coming down. It's not going down as fast as people are hoping. But the last thing you really want is the Fed to have to cut rates quickly, because that means that we're in some real economic challenges. I do think that there are there is some weakness in the labor market that's going to bubble up and show up eventually. But more importantly, I think car prices are coming down, which is good. Shelter is coming down, which is good. Um, it, it is a little bit bifurcated, to be honest with you, though, when it comes to shelter, because there are certain regions that inventory hasn't recovered, but there are other areas where inventory is piling up like crazy. If you have a minute, let's let's actually discuss that and let's look at it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So this right here is total inventory active listings in the United States. So you can see here 2017 to 2019, you know, it was on a gradual decline, but pretty much stayed within the 1.4 to like 1 million mark, right? Of course, you have some seasonality here. So you see these rises and falls, rises and falls. This is why shelter prices were okay. Then you've got a bigger problem. Now you have COVID and everything else coming down and interest rates starting to come down. So everyone is buying up pretty much anything coming to market. Anyone who has a home is refinancing, right? Right. So now a lot of people are sitting on sub 4% mortgages. Now here's the problem. When you start raising interest rates, you kind of incentivize people not to sell. Because right now, if you were to sell your home, which is sitting at, let's say, a 3.5% mortgage, you would have to buy a home at 700 seven and a half percent which, which is why you know, which is why high rates kind of actually make inflation even longer technically exactly so now you're stuck with a lot of low inventory the good thing is though depending on which market you're looking at you know things can vary significantly so if we look at atlanta the housing market here you can see that it still hasn't recovered back to its normal normal range that it was prior to COVID, right? So that's why you're seeing prices in this region kind of like they're they're still declining, but they're not declining a lot. They've actually flatlined. But if you look at let's say Dallas in Texas, uh housing 
While you're doing that, Austin says, Amit, I've been watching since about last August, and the longer I pay attention to everything, the more fun it is to see how the cycles work and seeing it over time. Well, I hope today is one of those days that's fun, because if anything, it gets you to learn a little bit about the psychology, and if the dip gets eaten up as well, then it's more part of the fun of the markets. Now, if you look at Texas, on the other hand, look at Texas. Texas is pretty much recovered back to its pre-pandemic levels, right? right of inventory. Right. So that's why you're seeing a lot of price declines happening in Texas. Same thing with Florida, right? So if you look at Florida housing, the active inventory list, look at this. It's back to it's pre-pandemic levels again. Okay, so so Chris, you know? you're saying for investors, if you look at this data, which is something the Fed is not exactly taking into account, because we're having more inventory of housing, if shelter, which the Fed said today is um, uh, that and gas is 50% of the CPI, your argument is shelter is not going to be 50% of the reason we have so much CPI for a long, for a while. Yeah. Like, it, it, so how many months do you think it'll take for that data to hit the Fed, which is what you're looking at right now? I mean, to be honest, it's it's all dependent on the market. Like right now, if you see this inventory, um, let's say in Florida, right? Inventory is starting to get back to its pre-pandemic levels, which means prices, they shouldn't necessarily decrease a lot, but they shouldn't increase anymore. Like previously, we saw huge amounts of gains in housing housing prices because inventory was low. Now inventory is getting back to normal, which means the growth rate should normalize also in terms of prices, right? So the mm. price of home should normalize and come back to its 1% to 2% per year increase, or depending on the sub market, they should go down slightly just to catch up with, um, with, uh, with what's going on right now. So expectations on home prices right now, it, it all depends um, how, uh, which state you're in. But I mean, we could look at some of the biggest housing areas, like so Florida's one, Texas is another. We could look at another one. Um, what's another state we could look at? That's um, like that's a big like uh, Illinois, California. Or you go to California? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's do California. So California. Let's see housing <laughs> inventory. California. Someone said Texas is the greatest country on the planet. That's how you know this is a this is a gun carrying freedom well, ringing. The Texas. the thing is. Texas and Florida have been pretty liberal with building new homes. That's the thing. Like, they're like, hey, listen, we've got a lot of people coming in. Let's build homes, build homes, build homes. So, um, yeah, look at this. California is actually not that high. It's actually kind of low. Look at the active listings in California. Well, what does that mean if it's getting low? That, that means that there's not a lot of people listing their homes in California. The inventory, the inventory of active, the active listings, which means that there's actively only 38,000 homes on the market in California versus in Texas, let's say um, active list in Texas, it's close to 90,000, right? Right. Okay, Chris, so we, we got uh, yeah. we got five minutes till the, till the market opens. And then, can you stay on for the market open a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, so. Can we talk oil for the next five minutes before we get into the market open? What the hell is going on with oil? For people who have no idea why oil is up, why is it up? And currently, I'm looking at oil that's very green today at 90, uh, 90 bucks for Brent and 85 for WTI. And and how do you think this is going to affect the next CPI report? Well, oil oil trades on sentiment with regards to future supply, right? So, if people feel like future supply is going to be constrained, then people buy up futures contracts now because they're like, oh, in the future. The price of oil is going to be higher because there's going to be less supply. So right now, OPEC is saying, hey, listen, we're going to keep doing production cuts. We're not going to raise production. Um, that's one reason why. So people are like, oh, in the future, OPEC is not going to be supplying additional barrels of oil. And number two, there's this whole issue with Israel and Iran possibly going into a kinetic war. And if right. they do go into a kinetic war... Iran is a major supplier of oil to the to the markets. It may not come to the United States, but it does go to like other parts of the world. So if the Iranian oil gets cut off, that means that people are going to have to source their oil from somewhere else. So because of that, people feel like we're going to get supply constrained. Um, in this regard, the easiest way to solve this would be two things. And I think Trump tried to do this a while where... He can just basically go to Saudi Arabia, who's like the biggest producer of oil in that region and be like, hey, guys, like, listen, I know you don't want to screw over the economy. So can you re raise production 
for generally for OPEC. And I'll make sure that the U.S. drillers are kept in check also. Mm. And at the same time with the U.S. drillers, give them an incentive to, you know, to basically produce more, but not ra- um, not undo things to the to the degree where people are having like a, a, a war. Because sometimes what happens is so the OPEC has tried this a couple of years where they've gone like super production mode, where they pr- overproduce. And the reason why is because if they overproduce, the price of oil comes down significantly and they can survive because they usually have some of the lowest cost production. But the drillers here in the United States, they would end up getting going out of business and going bankrupt. They tried this, I think, in 17. The thing is, though, the U.S. oil industry is pretty resilient. They figured out ways to how to actually produce oil even cheaper. Right. So they were able to survive. And, you know, and so now. You've got a point where the U.S. production is actually far outpacing the 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 what do you call it um, the OPEC amounts. The so so when, is, when do you think yeah. oil? When do you think this? When do you think this ninety dollars goes back down to normal? Or do you think it? I don't know. That's the thing. Oil is one of those things that no one can tell you. Like mm. oil is just oil is so volatile. That's exactly why the Fed does not include it in their core calculations, right? right. Where right. they exclude food and energy. The reason why is because energy can spike at any moment based on geopolitics and food has the same thing where you have one or two input costs that can get really put in there that throw things off like bird flu or or um, or like a contagion among like weather patterns. If they go really south in certain areas of the world, food prices can shoot up very quickly. So in order to kind of mitigate some of that, you know, that basically that up and down they exclude that, and that's what they call uh, core. Well, so, who gave who gave uh, Warren Buffett the insider trading information for him to buy up so much Occidental before it went up? There's no, <laughs> he's underperforming. I don't even know why people Wait, think really? there's insider information. Really? Yeah, he's underperforming an Oxy relative to their market. Just do uh, you yeah, do? You're, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. He would have been better off just buying the S and P five hundred, like he says, than buying Oxy. You know, yeah, you're right. So. You're right. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, Chris will be with me here probably for like another 15, 20 minutes. He'll be with me on the live stream today. We were supposed to go live at 8.20 and um, yeah, just things happened. And we, it's so sad that I titled it the most important day in the history of the planet Earth. And then people were, I feel so bad. People were waiting there at 8.20, but I'm sorry. I, 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 I just couldn't wake up, dude. I was, I was so tired. I slept so late, but we're here. 9.30 a.m. in about 15 seconds. We'll see how bloody this goes. Chris, I'm actually happy you're really you're here with me so we can kind of see how bad this dip is and if this dip really dips or if the market's like, fuck this, we're gobbling up these stocks. That's what happened so far this year. Let's see if we get a little bit of the same. 9.30 a.m. Thank you all for being here. The stock market is now open. All right, so we got Palantir, 2217, down 2.59% of the day. Robin, a nasty fall, down 3.3%, 17.68 S&P. We have not had a 2% day down for like a few months now for the S&P. Right now at 513, down about 1.1%. We'll see if that dip gets eaten up or if it continues to go down. Arm down 2%. Tesla, again, Tesla, dude. I think, Chris, you would agree with me. The fact that this thing is 173 is just incredible. Only down 2% on the day. Uh, if interest rates, uh, if, if, if the hot CPI can't get Tesla back to that 164, 165 range, not sure if Q1 earnings are going to be able to do so, but let's see as the market progresses. SoFi, all right, SoFi down 3%. It is what it is. I mean, SoFi was at 790 yesterday, down 3% today to 760. It's still holding sevens, which is good because you know, a month ago we were dealing with the sixes. So we'll see how that one plays out. This stupid Destiny Tech ETF. I didn't want to call it stupid. I haven't called it stupid until today, but this thing's down. 20% because people just piled into this because they think that they have SpaceX and OpenAI in the funds and therefore they should get exposure to it. Yeah, this thing's down 50% in the past two days. So this one definitely was one to be a little uh, a little cautious of. That one is down. 157 on Google, MasterCard 471, Meta's down 2%, NVIDIA's down 1.75%, DJT down 2%, that's down about 10% for the week. Lunar down 3%, SoundHound down 11.75%, Elf down 2%, Lyft down 2%, Uber down 2%, GM down 2%, and Novix down 5%, PayPal down 2.24. PayPal's still holding 65, it was at 67 in the pre-market, not that crazy. Again, we're seeing a green candle right there starting to form from 65.10, up already 30 cents from that level. MicroStrategy down 3.85. That's less about CPI, more about Bitcoin. Bitcoin took a nasty fall after the CPI came out. So 
MicroStrategy is down. Rocket Lab is down 4%. AMD is down 2%. You, you don't really want to own companies like Rocket Lab when we get a crappy CPI because these are companies that haven't really proven themselves. Again, long term, they'll be fine. But um, it's a space company with bad inflation, not really the best mix, but maybe a good dip opportunity for people that wanted to get entry today. Clean Spark at below 15. Chris, what are your thoughts on the Bitcoin miners? You're not in this play. What is your perspective here with these companies? I have no clue with Bitcoin miners. Like, like it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I really shy away from the space because it doesn't trade on any real fundamentals outside the price of Bitcoin, which the price of Bitcoin is just supply and demand. So I, I don't know, man. I, like I said, it's not for me. I'm more of a traditional investor. So, got it. If you want content um, around that, that's that's reach out to guys like Jesse. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted your thoughts on how you, because those are obviously very volatile. I knew you weren't bullish, but I mean, on a day like today, when CPI comes in this hot, you got to buy the dip or you got to, you know, it. I don't think it's thesis breaking by any sense of the imagination that we got hotter CPI, but these guys are going to be very volatile in a risk off environment. And that CPI doesn't mean we're risk off, but it kind of signals we're like at least risk off for today. And so that one's going to get hit. Uh, Coinbase is down. 2%, MicroStrategy down again, 3%, BitFarm's down 1.8%. Uh, Robin is recovering a little bit. It opened at like 1740-ish, now 1781, down 2.65%. I'm seeing green candles everywhere. Green candle on Robinhood. Uh, MicroStrategy still a little bit of red candle. Coinbase, very little red candle, but it was almost green. Mag7, I believe we'll have some green candles. Yeah, look at that. NVIDIA's got a green candle there at 841. NVIDIA was 841 yesterday. So the drop on NVIDIA today is not that crazy because it was at the same level yesterday. Amazon, nice green candle from 182. Look at that. Tesla, green candle from 171. Apple, still red candle. Microsoft, 421 red candle. And then Meta, 510. Um, Chris, let me ask you this question. What's your favorite out of the Mac 7 right now if you had to buy? I'd say Amazon. Amazon's probably the best in my opinion. They still have room where they can cut a little bit of expenses and cost and at the same time they're just they're just a beast man aws is still growing so i'd say i'd say amazon okay yeah i would agree i think amazon is incredible i think amazon you know it, it's made its way back after a long journey falling from 188 to 88 i also think meta is not crazy but the 50 percent bump in meta already makes it a little bit harder to to buy into that one some people were saying apple has a technical retracement back to 183 if they can have somewhat of a catalyst wwdc seems to be that catalyst that could at least make them break even for the year instead of down 10 percent for the year um so that one would be interesting as well all right apple's down 168 let's look at the semis all the semis are red but again guys i don't know what you guys i'm looking at the chat on a scale of one to ten how bad do you feel this dip is today 10 being the worst one being the least Let, let's get some numbers in the chat because I mean, it's red, but it's not that, it doesn't feel that crazy. ARM down 1%, ASML down 1.7, ON down 1.98, Intel down 0.82. Intel's getting very interesting to me because of how much cash they have. What's not interesting is the whole foundry revision. It's going to not be profitable for a while. We'll talk more about Intel in a little bit. They released a chip that's, they're saying, competitive to NVIDIA. Uh, I don't know if that's actually going to be competitive to NVIDIA, but it is something interesting that they're doing on the innovation side. Uh, SMCI down 1%, AMD down 1.42. Again, as AMD and NVIDIA were at these levels yesterday, SMCI taking a bit more of a tumble. Uh, but look at that green candle. It went from 871 to 893. I mean, dips have been bought. Dips have been bought at least today from what I'm seeing. Everyone, I, the average I'm looking at is like a three or a four. Derek Wall says five. Shout out to Derek. Thank you for being here. Chris, what would you say? On a one to 10, you've seen the market for the past five minutes. How bad do you think this dip is actually getting? I don't think there's a bad at all. I don't know. I don't know what kind of scale. Like, you mean like five being the worst, one being not like that 10 bad. being 10 being I don't want to show my wife my portfolio for a while. One being, you know, I'm up, which we're obviously not up. And then two or three being all right, it's down. Five, like five, five. five? Yeah, I agree with Derek. Five. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say so as well. I don't think the sentiment on this dip looks that crazy or also I think we would see more more red candles someone says ask me at the end of the week yeah i mean we'll know friday for sure how this ends up playing out um so let's see how well we see it someone uh, just said 10 being lizzo just party. <laughs> <laughs> well we expected beyonce we didn't expect beyonce we expected like an average like normally looking hot girl today on cpi and we we definitely got lizzo we did not get a beyonce or that normal girl um stocks and crypto says what's contributing to current inflation rent and energy prices correct rent and energy prices shelter and energy were over 50 percent of the cpi today 
And uh, that is why we're seeing a bit of a hit. Chris, why do you think core came in at 3.8 versus three? First of all, for the people that don't know what core is, what exactly is core and how is that different from headline CPI? And why do you think that came in hotter? Than, uh, than we thought at 3.8. Core is just inflation minus uh, food and energy because food and energy is volatile. That's it. There's not really that much different. Um, but food and energy, I mean, sorry, enough. Yeah, food and energy make up, um, they're just too volatile, basically. Um, yeah, what, what was the question? Sorry. Uh, the question is why do you think it came in hotter than um, 3.7, which is what the market wanted? Well, I mean, energy, everyone knows the price of energy is starting to climb up the last few months, right? So that mm. that wasn't anything that's that's new. And food prices, it's just weather-related patterns. I think certain parts of uh, the world are just dealing with weather issues. So that that probably contributed a little bit. But I don't I don't think that was really that high, man. Like yeah. I know people are saying it's high, but it's like 3.5 is only about one basis, one 100 basis points over the tar, over like 2.5, which is what a healthy economy should be. Our GDP is growing at this level. Also, typically you want your GDP to grow faster than inflation. Otherwise, you're 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 not doing so good in real terms. So right now our GDP is doing pretty good. It's on fire. So I don't know. I just I think at this point, the the narrative around inflation is a little bit played. Um, I think too many people are still focused on inflation as a benchmark to how they should invest for the rest of the year, where I'm more like, just chill, chill right now. You know, let the market market do its thing. Right now is not a time to be panicking, nor should it be a time to sell everything off. You know, I think we're going to get a sideways market for, for quite some time. I mean, did you see the difference between the price targets for most people that they put out in December and what yeah. they had to actually change up. Yeah. Most people you know, thought it would be 50, 50, 100, maybe at the end of the year by the SP we're at, you know, basically we hit five twenty. you know? Yeah. Um, we're at the top range of expectations. So, you know, there's not a lot of room to go further up, but there's not a lot of room to go down because the economy is still pretty strong. So I'd say right now we're, you know, we should, we should focus on strategies that are about maintaining, um, maintaining value, looking for undervalued companies in this market that are currently undergoing um, some transformations that can do extremely well for the rest of the year. So, you know, and right now I think there's a rotation. I, I did a post on Patreon where people should be focusing less on growth this year and more on value because I think value will likely outperform um, outperform growth. Yeah, and, and and the reasoning for that is obviously because growth has performed so well. So the question is how much is there left? But in that same breath, as you said, I don't think there's that much lower to go. We got a nice green candle on Palantir and on Robinhood. Nice little rebound there. I think one thing that's really interesting here is the options market. So I just looked at my portfolio and uh, it's it's not even down. And obviously I, I do have a decent amount of options in my portfolio, but it's down like maybe one or two percent. Uh, what, what, for people that have options and stocks are down aggressively on those options, but the options are not, can you explain to people why their options might not actually be as down? What's I mean, kind of it depends on there? your, it depends on your time, man. If it's something close, I'm not, I'm sure that they're not doing so well, but right. you got to remember you have, you have two year options. You, most of the options you've bought their leaps. Unless like you've been buying some shorter term options that no, I don't know no. of. Yeah. So you're not going to see a lot of volatility in that. So I wouldn't worry as much. Not to mention you've done, you do spreads and spreads cancel each other out, which means that you don't feel the volatility as much if you just do a naked call or a naked uh, put, you know? Yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, that's one of the things you've taught me really well is that on the bad days, you know, there is a way to kind of recover a little bit of those gains. Uh, because you have something that's canceling out the, the buy call as well. Yeah. Let me show you guys something that's actually pretty interesting. Um, this right here is something to watch for. So if you've seen how growth and value, they they play against each other, there are times where it's actually better to be in growth and then there are times to be, uh, better to be in value. Right now, we're at a point where we're at the highs in terms of uh, growth and right now, I think the move downward for growth is there where it doesn't mean that growth is going to, um, un, um, what do you call it, not perform. It just means that growth is going to slow down, whereas value is going to pick up a little bit. So 
just saying right now is a good time to look at value plays, not as much growth. And this is this is an excellent chart that kind of describes um, the growth versus value play, where you can see when growth is outperforming, usually um, value underperforms. And it's just it's like a like a what is that thing called? Like a it's pendulum a swinging. It's a seesaw. Yeah. 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 So. so so what are some value names that you like? Obviously, Verizon's a big one. Let's actually check. How's Verizon doing on a bloody red day? Is it how is it doing? Wow, look at that. It's down 1.58%. I mean, it's not as red as some of the other guys down five or six percent. And so you think companies like Verizon and maybe some of the Buffett stocks have some momentum built in because they were ignored for the latter half of or the first half of the year. But if growth is topping out a little bit or at least going sideways, money will rotate here. Well, here's the thing. I I I People want to try to try to figure out what is value and what's not. And I think the definition of value can be very, very um, different depending on the time frame that you're looking at it. So as an example, if you look at Facebook, right, or Meta um, last year, there clearly was value territory because it was PE was in the single digits, right? Correct. Now yeah. it's back in the 20, 30 PE range, which means that it's gone up significantly and it's in growth mode again. But a lot of that growth is coming in the coming from all the layoffs and stuff that they're doing. So my thing is you have to figure out internally, okay, why are you buying this company? Are you buying it because of its growth or are you buying it because it's value and people are not recognizing that? So as an example, if you look at, um, growth like let's say let's say celsius right celsius is technically considered to be a growth play because they're growing 50 60 percent year over year right whereas another company could be growing at maybe like five or six percent or even ten percent per year the difference is that five or ten percent could end up doing a lot of work internally to reduce costs and expand their margins and actually end up being a better play going forward than something like Celsius. But Celsius could be doing the same exact thing, where Celsius could be cutting expenses while raising revenue at the same time. So, you know, it just, it, it really depends on what it is. So I think the traditional definition of growth and value is very fungible. Um, so you don't think you, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like Kraft Heinz. You're not taking the conventional definition of no, I, I rarely take the conventional definition and just go based on that. Like for me right now, the way I'm the way I'm framing this is yes, you will have certain sectors that are insulated against market economics. Like as an example, we had this discussion in Finance Junkies where people were looking at remember we were talking about Tesla versus Verizon. Yeah. Right. Yep. Now some so people said hey, a year ago we did this discussion. Not even a year. We we spoke about it in December. Right. November, right. November. I think we spoke about November. And the thing is, the definitions were a little bit blurred. Why? Because the valuation of Tesla is based on its growth. So if growth slows down, Tesla is going to take a hit. Verizon was a value play because they're undervalued relative to their importance to the market and their ability to cut costs, which is their capex and grow profitability. Ah. So it just kind of means that you have to you have to be a little bit forward looking and figure out if a company has the tool has this has a fundamental situation where they can improve things during a bad market you know so i think today because when, a lot of, when, when people say verizon versus tesla like we had during that time in november i think tesla at that point was like 250 or something most people would say okay verizon some shitty phone company tesla's like the most innovative company in the world you're looking at it from a macro perspective saying hey verizon sold off 30% and you know, this is what they're doing to have profitable growth. Tesla hasn't sold off yet because the interest rates haven't really hit them. And so that dynamic is what showed you the value in a stock that's not growing as much as a company like Tesla, in which the growth has significantly slowed down, which means the value also has slowed down. Yeah. And you have to, and you have to remember relative, it's it, everything is relative to the stock price. So if, if, if you saw Tesla at $20 based on all the metrics that it has today, is Tesla growth or value? Right. It's value because right. you're basing it you know, you're basing it on that that um, that sentiment. Now, the the opposite can happen. So, if Tesla's trading at 350, it's clearly being valued for its growth. So, any slowdown in growth is going to knock that valuation down. So, I think that's that's one of the keys that people have to really remember in when you're looking at a company. You have to look at it 
not just based on like the company's personal performance, but also the macro and how it's going to impact that and how the company can actually guide against it. In my opinion, when it came down to Verizon, it was an easy call. Why? Because the company came out and said, we're guiding for lower CapEx. Like interest rates right now have really hurt a lot of other industries, but our cash flows are stable. We can use our cash flows to pay down our debt which means that this interest rate problem is not really a problem for us, which means that Verizon was a great play. Tesla, on the other hand, can't jar up more demand because, right, I mean, technically they can do it right now, but for the most part, Tesla can't go out there and just convince people to buy more electric cars right? because right now, every time you go to buy an electric car, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg, not to just to buy the car, but also to finance the goddamn thing, you know? Right. So. Okay, let me go through a couple more of these stocks, guys. Uh, any questions you have for Chris? He doesn't join us that often, so please put them in the chat, and we're going to um, use him to get out all the juicy info we want. Any stock-specific questions like, hey, Chris, what do you think of this stock? Maybe he has an answer, maybe he doesn't. And any macro questions, put it in the chat, and in a couple seconds or a couple minutes, we'll get his uh, take on these, and then we can get him out of here. NVIDIA, 8, not 858. NVIDIA's green, guys. Green candle. Robinhood, green candle from 1759. SoFi, little green candle, but it's there. Celsius green candle, Verizon, still a little red candle, but it was down 1.95%. Now it's down 1.25%. Palantir green candle from 22. Again, below 22 is just very hard to get that sucker below. I think what we're 18 minutes into the market open. If we were going to see Palantir go to 21 or Tesla go to 159, I feel like it would have happened, dude. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the next four hours, the market wakes up and they just like, you know what? The CPI is just so bad. We got to sell it off. But if in the first 18 minutes, we don't see that dramatic of selling, I agree with someone in the chat who said, this might be a day for the shorts to cover because the smartest shorts know that this market's hot and they're getting a really good opportunity to cover some of their short, maybe profitably or for free or for break even uh, without having to have too much pain. So that might be another thing that we're seeing that's actually helping the market recover a little bit. Uber only down 0.39%. That was down 2%. Um, Amazon that was down at like 182. Now it's at 183.93, basically almost 184. End phase 113. Now end phase is down. Chris, let me ask you this question real quick. Why is end phase down 7% today for those that don't know? Well, generally it's, it's with companies like end phase and believe it or not, Tesla, it's very simple. It's the same equation that I told people about last year when we had this discussion, when end phase was at 300. There's two things that these companies are going to trade on. One is the value of natural gas. Why? Because natural gas is how you generate electricity. Electricity prices factor into the decisions of people when they when they have to, you know, buy buy um, buy solar systems. So if your natural gas prices go higher, electricity prices go higher, and if electricity prices go higher, it's worthwhile to get an, a solar a solar roof. The other thing is cost of cost of financing. If you can finance it at three, four, five percent, you could you would probably go with solar right now because yeah. solar is personal. You would be taking out personal loans. You're probably paying close to nine to eleven percent for the average person to get solar, which means that it doesn't make sense to get solar. So right now, if the market is saying based on CPI, higher for longer, that means that the prospect of future rate cuts goes down, which means solar companies are have um, are not going to be able to sell more products in the future, primarily because rates are going to be longer, quote unquote. You know, So anything right now that requires consumer financing, like heavy consumer financing, is going to take a hit. So think about car companies. Think about solar companies like that, that require not like a small amount of money, like a cell phone plan. If it goes up by two, 3%, you're not like, oh my God, inflation, you know, but when it comes to a car or if it comes to like a 30, $40,000 solar roof, you're going to be a little bit careful when you, when you, when you sign up for this new thing. So. Yeah, no, I agree. And obviously the, the emphasis was getting up this week because the market thought the CPI would be cold and say so they, they were trying to get ahead of it. But then CPI comes in hot and then M phase is down 7%. You know, Tesla's starting to trend down. Tesla's down about 3.2%. 3, 3 um, not as bad as Enphase. FSD is really kind of keeping that narrative alive. And so we're seeing that one still have some momentum. Bitcoin, ETFs, well, they're well, down. Tesla, right. Tesla also is benefiting from the high oil prices. Correct. I mean, think think yep. about that. If right now you as the average consumer, just, just take yourself. And every time you go to a gas pump, and you see, I mean, if you're in California, I think it's like $7 a gallon in some places. But for the most Americans, you're looking at $4, maybe a little bit higher than that, depending on which area you're in. 
if you are going there and you're paying literally a car note at the gas station every time you go fill up, the next thing that you're thinking to yourself is, hey, you know what? I've been meaning to get a new car. Maybe I'll get an electric car instead. You know? Right. So. Right. No, I agree. 100% agree. Guys, what I'm looking at right here, and you guys are looking at the same thing I'm looking at, this is not a, it's not one of those days in 2022. We had many of those days in 2022. This is not it, dude. There's too many green candles bouncing around on good companies like a PayPal. Robin is at 1814. Nice little bounce from 1759. I mean, like it was at 1814 yesterday. <laughs> You know, like a lot of these prices are reflecting what we saw yesterday and dip buyers came in and they saw a really good opportunity, at least for now. Uh, the opportunity seems like it's decent and they bought the fucking dip. They said, fuck this. Inflation's coming down. This is a great opportunity to get in and see if we can get some cheaper prices on these equities. Okay, let's do rapid fire Chris questions. Chris, we'll probably take like 10 more minutes with these questions. Then I'll get you out of here. Thank you so much for being here today. This was a good day to have you on and you can just take like, a minute or two to answer each of these questions. Um, okay, so let's start off with um, PayPal. What do you think about PayPal right now? Eh, PayPal is going to struggle a little bit, but they're fine. You know, long term, they're still cash flowers. They're using the shares to buy back. Like, so PayPal will be fine long term. They're still a um, a very like they are still part of of everything like right now i bought i bought a game on steam it's linked to my paypal you know mm. quick easy you know so paypal there's definitely value there um but i think that people should not be valuing paypal like a growth company anymore they should think of it more like a value company and then base it on that so a pe of 17 is not bad, especially consider that they're still growing their top line. And at the same time, they're buying back a crap ton of shares. So um, with regards to PayPal, I think it's like not really a growth company, not really a value company. So just based it on that. Uh, we looked at this company a while ago or in early 2022, and you told me to stay the hell away. And uh, Big Brother was right there. What are your updated thoughts on Open Door? The business model is broken, dude. I really... It's just not a good business model, you know. Yeah, they're, they're down seven percent. By the way, guys, their uh, CEO he left like a year ago, or the president he stepped down. Yeah, so after he sold off, like <laughs> I think how many a billion, two billion dollars? There's a shares? lot. There's a lot of money he sold off and left. I don't it was know. bad. It was bad. I wonder what happened to Doctor Oakland. You remember him? Oh yeah, dude. No, I was. Not yeah, he, he doesn't tweet that much anymore. But he was. He built a whole company around Open Door. You know. Yep. Yep. Um. Tobar says, is Verizon too high to buy now or should we wait for a bigger pullback? Um, I don't really think it's going to pull back that much. I think right now you're going to, this is one of those times where Verizon gets flattened, right? Where you just see like very slow, progressive upwards moves, but it's going to be very slow. And most people are going to be in Verizon are going to be in it for that nice juicy dividend right now. So can, can, you, can you speak is, to that? Can, can you speak to that? This is a good catalyst for this question. When when rates come down, the dividend on Verizon is 6.58. What is the relationship between high yielding Divi stocks and rates eventually coming down? Because most people think rates come down, then Tesla goes up. But why is rates going down a catalyst for a company like Verizon or TFC with dividends to go up? Okay. So right now, imagine yourself, you're 65 years old, you're retired, you've got $200,000, maybe $300,000 sitting around, right? You can go into the treasury market and get a five and a quarter percent or five and a half percent on your money. Now, the thing is, if the Fed starts cutting interest rates, what's going to happen? If the Fed starts cutting interest rates now, all of a sudden, if you go to the treasury and you only get, let's say, three percent, right, which is their longer term target or two point five percent, you are not going to have enough money to survive. So what do you do instead? You go and you buy a dividend company that's giving you six, seven percent. Right. So what's going to happen is because of that, the, the thing gets bid up. Now, Verizon also increases their dividend over time. So as, as time goes on, that dividend also increases, which means that in, in terms of like the future, you can actually see that, you know, it, it makes sense that the stock price would be commensurate with that. So I think right now people are just going to be buying up a lot of these Divi stocks once the Fed starts cutting rates in order to chase the yield. The other thing is, Verizon has a lot of debt on their balance sheet, which always is going to have to be refinanced. So if we get lower interest rates, that means that they can refinance that debt at lower amounts. So if they can finance it at refinance some of that debt at lower amounts, then that's cash flow 
which they don't have to have outgoing, that that money gets retained on the balance sheet and also provides more money to pay more dividends in the forward in the coming years. So I think right now Verizon benefits from two two angles. They benefit from rate cuts because the cost of capital goes down, but then they also benefit from people chasing the yield. And so Verizon is likely to get back to like the 50s and the 55 mark. I mean, I think it's a great company to buy and hold. I mean, you're getting a six and a half, seven percent. And it's a qualified dividend, by the way. So you're getting a 6.7 percent qualified dividend, you know. So it, it's not even like interest. You're, you're actually getting a better, better tax treatment for being in Verizon. Yeah, I agree. And uh, when Verizon got sold off, so when the, to, from my perspective too, when people said, uh, when that question said, can Verizon get sold off more? It was sold off so much, you know? Like it, it, in, in, in July, when you started looking at it, the thing was that 23, 24, I mean, like it's hard for the market to sell it off again without a real reason being there. And um, that's what we have right now in Verizon. And you get the nice dividend. Benny says, uh, I'm up 60% of my Amazon position. Is it wise to sell some of it and buy some Tesla for averaging down or just continue to hold and wait for lower prices on Tesla? So I guess the question here is if you have Amazon profits, do you trade those to buy the dip on Tesla? Wait, say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, question is basically, I have Amazon profits. Should I trade some of those profits to buy the dip on Tesla? Why? Why buy? <laughs> why? Um, why pay the taxes? Just enjoy your Amazon position. Amazon is growing. They're doing what they're supposed to. Tesla is in a rough patch. I'd say wait. But then again, I'm I'm not your financial advisor. I think the growth prospects for Tesla are still there, but they're gonna be they're gonna take more time than people are 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 assuming. So I think right now Tesla is just gonna trade between 125 and 175 for quite some time. They're also slowing down significantly, which means the market may end up taking that into perspective and cutting down their valuation significantly. That's why you saw all the price reductions in Tesla's, um, uh, what is that thing called? All the analyst reports, they 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 put that right. down. So. All right. Chris, what do you think of uh, NVIDIA? Why do you think this bad boy is saying a big middle finger to the market? It's up 2% right now. I mean, bro, they're generating money and they're growing. You know, they're leading the AI revolution. So they're, they're trading more on sentiment than on fundamentals, but it's okay. I, whatever, there's an there's an investment saying, don't fight the trend. Mm -hmm. And right now the trend is AI. So if you're trying to short NVIDIA right now, you, good luck. Okay, let's talk about that as well. So the 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 inflation report, for those that are just joining, 3.5 headline, 3.8 core, not the best. Uh, AI company like NVIDIA, dip is getting eaten up pretty aggressively. I mean, this is quite phenomenal to see this big of a green candle at 867 after a, a decently hot report. How real, so it's a two-part question. Number one, how real do you think AI actually is when it comes to increasing earnings for companies, which would increase their stock prices? And then B, um, do you think the market uh, demand for AI exposure is so large that that can overcome even stickier inflation going into the next six months? Um. I think AI is actually very important, and I think long term it's going to be very deflationary. Um, we may not have necessarily seen that just yet, but I think eventually it's going to make its way into the general market. So, you know, overall, if you look at technology, right, technology ha has a habit of helping reduce expenses and reduce costs to go from point A to point B, right? So, whenever right. you have these technological leaps, you tend to have a lot of deflation happen. So with regards to AI, I think eventually people are going to figure out that maybe I don't need 10 coders to do this one thing. Mm. Maybe I can just use a co-pilot to do it with two people, right? Maybe I don't need to diagnose X, Y, and Z problems. Like right now, if I have, I'm working on, I work on some certain softwares where back in the day you had to look through stuff, you have to find stuff. And now it's a, it's an AI automated feature where now I, you get all these detection things automatically. Like it's, it's crazy. The amount of um, complexity, even a complex system can be, can be like simplified using certain AI applications. So I think overall the net benefit of AI is going to be deflationary and the companies that can provide those services are going to be, um, they're going to be really, they're going to do well. So as an example, that's why I'm bullish on Snowflake. So, so do you think the market demand for that sort of revolutionary potential of AI, that deflationary potential is enough to overcome sticky inflation if inflation is sticky for the next five months? 
I like, think can so. NVIDIA keep pumping if we get another couple hot CPI reports? Not NVIDIA yeah. specifically, but you know what I mean, just AI stocks. Yeah, I think so. I think right now we're we're still in a very early early adoption period of AI. Now there are certain areas that are getting bid up like crazy. Um, on a lot of companies that say they're AI players, they're getting bid up a lot, but they, they may not necessarily end up providing that that value. So you'd have to be very careful with it to figure out who actually is providing real value. So as an example, if you go back to like the 2000s, the dot coms, everyone had a website, right? But not every website ended up making money. The websites that did make money did really well. Google, Amazon, Meta, which is Facebook, right? Those did extremely well. So you have to figure out right now among the AI space, who are the actual winners going to be and make your bets based on that. So the cloud providers, I think, are ultimately going to be winners anyway, because they provide the backend infrastructure you need to make AI work and possible. But then there's going to be companies that build um, applications. applications. So do you think, do you think AI is a similar rush to cloud computing that we had in 2010? Uh, I think there's, I think there's a key, comp key differences in that. It's just, it's a matter of trying to figure out which companies are actually doing the real AI work, you know, and which ones actually have useful products. I mean, you're looking at valuations on some of these AI companies and they're just going absolutely berserk. Like, I think, what are some of the ones? Anthropic, right? Anthropic's yeah. valuations just keeps tripling. Every time I hear the name Anthropic, I see the valuations doubled. Well, because right. I think Amazon AI. putting more money in them because they're afraid of open yeah. AI and they want to keep competing, right? Yeah. Open AI is the same thing. Every time I hear about open AI, it just keeps doubling. Now, the question is, what is the ultimate value of open AI going to be? I mean, here's a real question. Do you still use ChatGPT for anything? I actually do. I use it every day. So I am a power user, but there's not a lot of people like me. I mean, people use it, but it's not like you know synonymous with mm -hmm. Google yet. Yeah, and I think that's the key, right? Where there will be AI applications that come down the line, but I think in terms of mass consumer adoption of AI, it's not necessarily there just yet. Maybe there'll be, maybe Apple will come out with an AI powered Siri that ends up, you know, being much better than what it is today. Or like even now, Amazon with its Alexa products, I, I, I don't know who the ultimate beneficiary of. AI is really going to be, to be honest with you. But if I had to make an educated guess, I would say from an enterprise software perspective, it's companies like Palantir and Snowflake. <laughs> it hurts you so much, but you had to say it. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I think Palantir, Snowflake, Databricks, Datadog, all these companies are going to, are going to do well uh, over this next couple of years when we have AI. Um, question for Chris, you liked arm before they went public, but you don't talk about them anymore. Why not? Their valuation is just absolutely berserk, man, for the amount of money that they generate. Yeah, this one, I agree with you, dude. They're doing 3 billion in revenue, 18% year over year growth. Market cap is 130. I mean, yeah, I don't know how that makes sense. I know arm is, so, I mean, you know, better than everyone, how vital arm is, but that's kind of, yeah. that's a lot to pay. Yeah. Decent amount to pay on that one. Um, okay, let's do one or two more and then we'll get you out of here, Chris. Uh, Intel, any thoughts on Intel at all? Now that it's fallen 10%. It's really, really hard to do foundry services in the United States. Um, I think I'm going to pull up a video real quick. Is that, that because of the cost of labor? Is that the main reason? It's not just the cost of labor. There's, um, uh, hold on one second. Let me just pull it up right now. Yeah, Why? Taiwan. Uh, thank you everybody for being here again. If you're just joining, CPI came in hot, core came in hot, but the market is not like it's a red day, but it's not one of those days I think people thought that would happen in the pre market initially when we saw the market take a tumble. And so we're seeing a lot of rebounds, dude. Robin is up, Pounter's up, uh, Arm is up, green candle there, Snowflake green candle from 151. Like, about 2% to 3% down was the place where market stepped in and decided to buy the dip. S&P down 1%, which is bad, but I mean, you would think with this hot CPI, it would be much worse. And it's like the bears who want 4,800 on the, like, I don't know if that happens, man. And if this CPI can't get you to 4,800, what's going to get us to 4,800, right? Like what really we would need a, a string of really bad CPIs to, I think, get that to happen. And even then you have to deal with the fact that companies in another week, they're going to start putting up amazing numbers going into Q2 earnings. 
Um, TSM is opening chip shops in Arizona. That's correct. They got $6 billion in subsidies by Biden yesterday. So that's going to really help expand and diversify chip creating. Again, this thing's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger when it comes to chips and their ability to expand, uh, which means AI as well. And AI based services are going to expand from that when that happens as well. Uh, so, man, give me that? one minute. I'm almost done trying to find it. Yeah. Uh, DB says, Amit, ask Chris about SoFi and Alibaba. I can give you his thoughts there. He uh, he thinks SoFi is just a bank and Alibaba is in China, even though he thinks Alibaba is valuable, but it's in China. Yeah, there, there's definitely value in, um, in Alibaba, but it's just something you have to be very, um, very cognizant of. It's just like they're more, they're more dependent on, on, um, what is that thing called on governmental policies? And so when it comes to that, that's a, that's a risk that you can't really quantify, you know? So, yeah, I agree. Hasi says, have you tried perplexity? I like it a lot better than ChatGPT. I do like it, but this thing's it, they're raising at a billion bucks, dude. And I don't even think perplexity makes any money or they, they make money, but it's nowhere near enough to justify that revenue multiple. So again, if the, if the private markets are willing to give a company like perplexity or anthropic or open AI, 200 times ARR, 100 times ARR. When that was happening in 2021, and you had like OpenSea, which was the NFT marketplace, if you guys remember that, trading at uh, 13 billion, that was because of, of like, quite frankly, bullshit crypto hype. But now these companies getting those private market multiples, which are excessive, but the idea is they will grow into those, whereas the crypto companies never had a chance. But the reason they're going to grow into those is because AI is like actually real. And so we're seeing that right now. I'm having a tough time finding. Yeah, no worries, video. no worries. We'll, we'll, we'll watch it later. But the the plan, what the thing that Morris Chang, who was founder of TSMC, said, it's really, really hard to do um, to do AI to do chips in the United States. It's just a very big cultural difference between the two countries, and because of that, there's there's just not a lot of room for the U.S. to grow its chip manufacturing um, prowess relative to hold on okay i found it finally one second what was that yahoo finance or something? no it was on um hold on one second it was on uh youtube hold on all right can you see that oh it was a short okay gotcha yeah, yeah. out of this of the scientists i want to give one just simple example of one individual that i think affects us all uh there's a individual who was trained here in the united states uh, worked at texas instruments for 25 years and felt like he hit a bamboo ceiling uh, and felt that whether it was because of ethnicity or racism or certain views, uh, uh, that he was not going to send higher. It's not and this. Taiwan said, why don't you come here and build your company and we'll give you money. Uh, that individual was Morris Chang and the company was Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, TSMC. It could have been Texas Semiconductor Manufacturing Corp. And I hope that we don't make that mistake. Oh, no, that's the point, though. It's a good point. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah, not talking just... about how hard it is, but he's basically saying, yeah, we could have had this in the United States and we... We didn't no, no, that, that's that's something that he said. No, there was something. It was something that Morris Chang said, where basically there's a huge cultural difference between how we work here in the United States versus how they work in um, in Taiwan. Like, right, like we have labor, to, we have labor protection laws. You know, <laughs> well, not only no, I wouldn't say labor protection laws because they have labor protection over there in um, in in Taiwan as well. But the point is. The way that you have to like almost dedicate your life to becoming an employee for TSMC to get so many nuances and intricacies of semiconductor production, right? That US, you would never find employees that have that same level of zeal in mm -hmm. order to do that. Where you're thinking you're you're th you're talking about people that are working 12 to 18 hour days in a foundry, but they're also living on site and working to make things work right, right? you're not going right. to find employees like that in the united states or not without the, the super high cost i don't know i don't even think the cost is the problem i think it's just a culture and also they have to be there for almost 12 13 sometimes a decade plus just to become very proficient at it i really wish i could find this goddamn clip give me like one more minute and i'll find yeah, it. yeah no worries no worries but i think your point is obviously well well taken um, in regards to how much skill is actually needed to develop a founder business. And that's why Intel said, look, we're not going to be profitable for four or five years and you got to deal with it. Um, that's why the market gave them a bit of a hit. 
Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's go through some of these other equities, guys. I mean, look, it's not doing that bad. Robinhood, 1819. Bitcoin back to 68.2. It was at 67. Again, that pre-market dip that we saw uh, at 9 a.m., um, it, like, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's lasted for most stocks. Microsoft down about a percent. And now Apple, it's taken the brunt of the hit because Apple, I think there's so much confusion about their business, but Apple is definitely down 1.32. NVIDIA's up. Tesla, it's down 2%. But again, you would expect with that CPI, which indicates rates are higher for longer, Tesla should be down. Rates are not good for Tesla. The thing that's keeping it up is three letters. And you could say Elon's pumping it, but he's doing a good job if he's pumping it, which is FSD. And that is what's allowing Tesla to kind of maintain these levels. And then obviously oil prices as well. Amazon 184, Google 157. Yesterday, Google unveiled a new chip with powered by an ARM CPU and a Microsoft Copilot coding competitor. And the market ate it up. I mean, the market really ate up that news. We'll see if that actually materially results in increased revenues. I think they have about two quarters to kind of show the impact of that. But the market is about perception. And Google's giving a pretty good perception that they were cheap and they have some innovations in the pipeline. Um, crypto. So clean spark recovered from 1478 coinbase is green guys. Coinbase was at 234. It's at 243. Not bad at all. Marathon's down a little bit. Huts down a little bit. Cypher's up. Iren is up. MicroStrategy down. MicroStrategy was at 1376. It's at 1433 recovered most of the 5% gain. I think there's going to, you're going to need a lot more to get this market to really take a hit and inflation, which we all know is eventually going to die is not going to be the thing that gets the market to care that much. At least right now. Chris, we don't have the video. Find it, okay. Forget it. Yeah. yeah. I'll see you guys later. I'll find it for another time. Yeah. Thank you, man. We really appreciate it. I look real quick. I'm putting Chris's Twitter in the chat. And uh, so that's his Twitter. Make sure to follow him. And I'm putting his Patreon. Chris uh, it has a Patreon. I think it's like, Chris, how much is it to join and be a Patreon? I think it's like 15 bucks. Right okay. Now. For $15, you get a lot of analysis. You get access to a very good Discord. And um, you get to basically ask him questions and he, he'll he respond uh, reasonably within the Discord and uh, you get to pick his brain. And he's you know one of the smartest guys I know. He's taught me everything I know about investing and a lot of people have made a lot of fucking money by being in that Patreon. So I'll put that in the chat as well and you guys can check him out. By the way, there is one thing before I let you guys go. Look at BPYPM and BPYPN right now today. I don't, I don't, I don't know if Weeble has preferred equity in there. It probably doesn't. Yeah, we got to do a whole episode on that thing, dude. Because yeah. we've been talking about it for a while here and there on financial. So one day, Chris will come on the pod. Uh, maybe during the weekend, we'll see if Chris is free, and we'll just do a full episode on BPYPN yeah. and commercial real estate because that's a that'll be a good play. I think right now there's a lot of opportunities in preferred equity that maybe a lot of people don't necessarily look at, and it's also not a very liquid market. So I think just retail investors have access to certain preferred equity offerings. It's just they don't know about it. Yeah, and it's not on Robinhood, it, obviously. It's not on. So yeah. they, they don't get to benefit from it. But yeah, I'd, I'd say look at some preferred equity. We have to do two pods, dude. We have to do the Snowflake pod and the fucking BPYPN pod. So let's get one of those done on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, whenever you're free. And then we'll do yeah. the next one the next week. We'll go from there. Yep. See you later. All right. Thank you, Chris. Means a lot. See you later. All right. All right. Back to just me. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And looking at the market, dude, I cannot believe I slept through CPI. I was just, I really thought I could stay up all night and get away with it. You know what I think this means, guys? I think this means I'm actually getting old. Because I thought sleeping at 4 a.m., I'll be up in time. And I was up. But you know when you put your head down just a little longer and then you get into the dream world. Um, and then I couldn't wait. I think, I think what this experience has taught me is that I just need my sleep. And... I don't usually do all nighters, but yesterday I was like, no, fuck it. I'm going to stay up. I'm going to get a bunch of work done. I'm going to do an all nighter. I, I don't think I could do that anymore. I have too much of a responsibility to be awake for the show. But more importantly, I just like my health probably is not going to allow me to really do all nighters anymore. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, you're here. Sanjay says, your tweets were hilarious, man, talking about your overnight plans, and then falling asleep just when it mattered. Yeah, no one go through my tweets. No one go through my tweet. I was talking like a boss last night, dude. I was like, fuck everybody. I'm staying awake. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing what it takes to achieve my destiny of being awake this night. Uh, yeah, it, it's, I wish I, I wish I'd, I'd come through with the dunk, uh, this morning by actually waking up on time. So those tweets have aged very badly. Let's listen to Dan Ives and why he's super bullish on Google based on the announcements they made, they made last night. Here we go. Senior Equity Analyst Dan Ives, good to have you here on Great set. Great to be here. 
Um, the fact that Google moved higher on this news, Alphabet moved higher on this news, I suspect you're not surprised since this is a top pick for you. But I guess break down what you thought was the most notable in terms of disclosures, because this wasn't the only one that we got yeah, in terms of AI today. I think this is the fuck the muscles. This is really them going on the offense. Of Dude, I thought he said something else just now. <laughs> this wasn't the only one that we got yeah, in terms of AI today. I think this is the fuck the muscles. This you, it, it didn't sound like flex to me. It sounded a little, a little, a little raunchier. This is really them going on the offensive instead of the defensive. From an AI stack perspective, I think this could gain share in hyperscale. And when we look at what we've seen with Microsoft, and I think eventually we'll see with Amazon as well, we're talking about a trillion dollar market opportunity over the next decade. So when you look at what Kurian and Google are doing, this was exactly what they needed to go after. But also it's developers. It's music to the ears of developers. Look, we believe some of the parts, 30 to $40 per share incremental for the AI opportunity. In terms of the custom chip piece of news that we got today specifically, is Alphabet behind the ball, uh, at least in terms of disclosing it, when you've seen similar disclosures from some of these other companies like Microsoft, like Meta, like others? Yeah, clearly late to the game, but, but not too late. And I think this was something many were you know, really yelling for them to do. They did it, and now it's really about can they gain more and more share within their install base? Because it was a missing piece in the puzzle, and I think if you look at everything they did in terms of from some of the disclosures, from the chip side, you know, to I think some of the announcements that, that they're making even on a customer perspective, it shows this is not a company with back against the wall. It's a company on the offensive. And I look, I believe... And we believe the Webbush is probably on, on large cap, continues to be extremely undervalued relative to the opportunity. So Dan Ives is bullish on Google. Um, and his argument is that out of the old, old Max 7, it's one of the cheaper ones. He is correct about that. It has run from that 130 level. So we'll see if the market's able to give it more premium. But Google was the one to bet on this year out of old Max 7, just given how oversold they got. If you bet on them at the 130 range, um, you didn't do too bad. Again, guys, we're getting a bounce. Look at PayPal. Look at that green candle. Look how thick and big that freaking green candle is, dude. 65.89 up from 65.10. So far back to the 770s. Where's Hood? Where's good old Vlad? Where is he at? Look at that, baby. 18.23. It's up from 17.59. Um, I mean, it just you just I I don't know, dude. I I I've been saying under you know this $19 range, 18.5 range. What I'm looking at the order book flow is people want these shares. And today we got a nasty CPI at Think Tanks. People wanted those shares even lower, right? They were ready to buy those up. This is really good if you're a Hood shareholder because for the longest, Hood was stuck at 6 to $8. Then we broke out. We broke out from $10 to $18 within the course of three months. And now we're holding, at least for now, 18, which is very bullish, dude, because it means there's real support, there's real momentum, there's real people that want to buy, this thing's not tanking all the way to 15, 16. Like, at that gold event solidified the market's interest. It wasn't just a, like, a, oh, they have some fancy live stream event and then we're just going to buy it and dump it. It's like, no, no, no. People are expecting massive numbers. The amount of people I talked to over yesterday, someone said they got a $3,000 Roth IRA match. Someone said they got a $6,000 match. Someone told me they got a $10,000 match and they're showing me these screenshots. And I'm like, dude, this is free money. People are getting to bring over all their assets onto this platform. So that gold event, I think, solidified the market's expectations for really strong numbers, which is why they're buying the dip versus selling it off Um even though it has performed very well since the beginning of the year. TFC 3765, PayPal 65, Celsius, nice bounce as well. Uh, fell to about 8290 at 8330 right now. Tesla, again, the momentum is there. I don't know what takes Tesla back down to that 160 range after this FSD bombshell has been dropped by Elon with the Robotoxy plans, but uh, that one's only down 2.3%. IWM recovered a little bit. It was at 200, it was at 200, it was at 199. Now it's at 20176. Uh, DXYZ, that's down 22%. That ETF we talked about, so that one's getting hit. Meta's green, 518 DJT, that's down. This is one of those days you don't want to own really crappy companies because obviously if inflation's you know going to be here for longer um, or rates are going to be here long for longer because inflation is sticky, then the crappy companies are going to do the worst. MicroStrategy is green. AMD down 1.5 is the same price it was at yesterday. You know, it's not that crazy. Not that crazy at all. Heavy D says, just got my Roth 3% today. Yeah, dude, it's a lot. It's a lot of people. And, and Vlad said 25,000 people brought over their, their IRAs over the past um, over the past 90 days. So I, I don't know. I, I'm going to do a bigger write-up on Twitter probably in the next week on like what I expect the Q1 earnings to look like. But I've been doing some preliminary numbers. And if they're anywhere close to what I think it could be, yeah, the market's 
the market wants these shares at these prices. You know, they're not letting it fall back down to 13, 14, 15. It's not, it didn't pump for three months and it's selling off. And even on a day where it should sell off with CPI, people are there to buy because they actually expect real progress and real growth. Uh, SLG 5178, that's down 6%. Commercial REITs are definitely down today. Uh, commercial REITs don't benefit from rates being higher. It looks like rates are not even going to be higher, but they're going to be high for longer. And so commercial REITs are down. Where's end phase? End phase is still probably getting hit. Even end phase is recovering. It was down 7%. Now it's down 5%. So you got a green candle on end phase. I mean, it's pretty damn incredible. The resiliency of this market NVIDIA at 864, not bad at all. Siraj, thank you for the $2 super chat. When do they release monthly hood metrics? There's none. We uh, we only get March earnings. So they only do it for the first two months of the quarter and then we have earnings. So, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because if they gave the third month, then, then they would basically be telling earnings. So we're going to have to wait till May 8th for the actual earnings as well. Uh, Dutch bros are green. Yeah, there you go. Dutch bros is green, up 1.8% as well. Austin says, Amit, are you running again today? Austin, I'm happy you brought this up. That is another excuse I will use for why I slept late today. I ran yesterday for the, for the, for the, uh, I ran even though I don't live in the Middle East. That was good, dude. Don't lie. That was good. Anyway, I ran yesterday and uh, I, I did the sauna and it was the second day in a row, which typically you're supposed to take a day. You're supposed to take a break, right? In between days when you just get back to working out. I haven't worked out in two months, but I did two days in a row. And so, and I stayed up till 4 a.m. So think about this. I ran two days in a row, aggressive running, sauna, sweating, bodies hit, and I barely slept, which is what led to me sleeping in. So it's not the best excuse. And it's prob and honestly, I really didn't think I was going to sleep in, dude. I was ready to go. But uh, it is one thing that points out why I was uh, tired to wake up this morning. But yes, I will be running today again. We're, we're going three days in a row. We're doing it. We're going three days in a row. Uh, Amit, please help. Is Enovix going to zero? Enovix is not going to zero in my opinion. But you got to remember, and we've been saying this for a long time, it is a startup that is public. It's not really a real company yet. They're doing some real things, but in terms of operating metrics, free cash flow, revenue growth, not like nothing's there, right? They did an acquisition which got the revenue up to like 7 million year over year, but that acquisition is not going to materially impact the stock. This is a company you buy it, you forget it forever. Same thing with ABCL, same thing with DNA. You buy it, you buy it with money that's like very small percentage of your portfolio, you take a risk on it unless you're ultra bullish. I and mean, if you're ultra bullish, you got to be able to recite to me the 10k if I ask you any questions from this company. If you can't then you put maybe one or two percent of your portfolio, if even that, and you just you don't look at it, right? Because over time they will probably do well if you believe the battery technology will play out. But down four percent on the day is because they're a startup that's public that has bad interest rates, right? So they're gonna get the brunt of some of the pain that the market's gonna have when it comes to sell side pressure. Um, and so that's what we got right now. Amit, your pull-ups used uh pulled up the S P. Why did you stop, man? Yeah, I gotta get back to my pull-ups. I got I, right now I'm just trying to get back to cardio and like get back into the, the gist of running, but we'll get back into lifting and all that stuff. By the way, I got flamed yesterday. I, I don't know. I do not know how I got flamed yesterday, but this is what I got flamed for, dude. I got flamed for this shit. I wore a glove to the gym yesterday for the first time in forever. And I usually don't wear a glove to the, 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 the sad part about me getting flamed yesterday. The, the, by the way, the caption was pretty good. I said, uh, second day back at the gym, going to try to drink up all the red during this workout before CPI tomorrow. I, I didn't end up doing a good job drinking up all the red, but um, uh, I never wear a glove. And then today, I, I yesterday, I was like, you know what? Let me just wear a glove. Like, like maybe it'll, you know, I don't know. I honestly, I thought the glove would make me look cool. Okay, there, I said it. The glove would make me look cool. And then everyone in the in the fucking comments are just like, why are you wearing a glove? And I'm like, it's a workout glove. Like people wear gloves, and people were just like flaming for wearing a glove. And so now I'm just not gonna wear a glove anymore because, or I'm gonna wear it, but I'm not gonna fucking take pictures anymore because everyone. Everyone gets upset just because I wore a glove. I was like, it's a glove. It's it's not that serious. It's a glove. But uh, but yeah, that that's so I so I was at the gym yesterday and we'll go back today. Robin Hood's green, baby. <laughs> Let's freaking go. Robin Hood's green, 1834, 1759. So what is that? Let's calculate that. 17, 1834 minus 17.59 divided by 17.59. Wait, I did that wrong. 18.34 minus 17.59. Okay, divided by 17.59. That is a 4.2% bump from the low. You're up 4% from the low if you got the bottom. Not bad at all. Player one says only wear gloves if you're lifting. How do you know I wasn't lifting? See, that's the thing. In that caption, I didn't say I was running on cardio. I just said I'm going to the gym. And still, and, you know, I thought people would assume I was lifting. I didn't end up lifting yesterday, but I, I thought people would assume, oh, it's normal to wear a glove when you're lifting. Still, people said 
wearing the glove uh, means basically people call me a little bitch. And I was like, what? I'm, pro I'm protecting my hands. Like, like, what do you mean I'm a little bitch? Like, what, what's going on here? So I'm still going to wear the glove. I don't care. I'm still going to wear the glove. I, I, it did make me feel cooler. Honestly, the reason I wore the glove yesterday also is because my hands were so sweaty because like it got randomly hot at like 5 p.m. And I was just like, I hate when my hands get super sweaty. So I was like, oh, let me wear the glove. Let it you know, protect a little bit of the sweat. Uh, but still ends up getting clipped flame for that. Pound tier 2263 SP. Look at SP, dude. It's down 0.86%. It was down almost 1.5% today. Now it's down 0.86%. SP recovering as well. Ron says, be a man of it and embrace the callus. See, that's not good advice, dude. That like your, your hands will actually hurt. That's not, I'm getting older now. I can't have all these parts of my body getting messed up. We can't have this happen. <laughs> ask your mom if the gloves make you look cool real answer the opposite <laughs> yeah my mom probably would have said you don't look cool um what else do we got what else do we got what else do we got uh da -da -da -da. nvidia where's nvidia where's nvidia where's nvidia look at that dude 1.2 percent up on nvidia 863 nvidia robin and dutch bros are green in this watch list occidental is green pound tier 2262 nice green candle from 2201 if someone got the 22 dollar dip on pound tier congrats not bad, not bad at all. Uh, right now here at 2263. Tilray, this thing fell 20% yesterday because they had bad guidance. They're a weed company. They're up 4% on the day. Uh, surprise, these guys are actually up. I guess this is a recovery because bad CPI, you would think these guys were down more, but they're up. Tesla's red 2%, Reddit's down 3%, Google's down 0.77%, and then Meta is green on the day 517. Dude, this is not bad. This is not as bad as what people thought it would be. This is absolutely not as bad as what people thought it would be. Yeah, let's go to Bitcoin. Where's Bitcoin? Let's check the inflows as well. The inflows were not the best. 68704. Wow, Bitcoin's trying to make a run back to 69. It was at 67993 uh, this morning, right? No, no, hold on. One day. 674772. We bottomed on Bitcoin at 951. Now at 1028. We're up almost a percent higher from there. Chris says he bought the pound tier dip. We'll continue to buy in as if it drops watching for $15 or 18, but might be difficult with buyer interest. Yeah, I think 15 to 18, I think under 20 is not going to be easy. Look, if a day like today could not get pound tier under 20, I honestly, and I would love to get people's perspectives in the chat. What gets pound tier under 20? Because everyone, you know, I've been saying, I think pound tier doesn't go under 20. I think there's too much support. There have been some people on Twitter saying the technical analysis shows it's going back to 1817. And I'm like, sure, that's fine. But technicals fail when the fundamentals are intact. If Pound Tier is a monster earnings and on a day like this where we've got the hottest CPI in the past four months, that can't get the bad boy down to 20. What gets it below 20? What gets Tesla to 145? Like what actually has to happen for these companies to drop at those levels that everyone would be, you know, selling a, a kidney to be able to buy more prices at? I don't know if we see those. I really don't especially if Q1 is going to crush, which from what I'm looking at, dude, Q1 looks like it's going to absolutely crush. Uh, and so there would have to be like a scandal or a controversy or something bad in the company specifically, like Carp getting a haircut. Yes, that would happen for, I think, it to really, really tank. Sunday says, I don't think we're seeing pound turn 20 anymore unless they tank engineers, which is unlikely anyway. Yeah, or they tank earnings, which is unlikely. Yeah, I agree. I think there would have to be a really big macro crash. But again, today, sh is, today should be the macro crash, right? Today should be the S&P falling off a cliff. We're at 514 on the S&P, dude. We were at 520 yesterday. Like, yeah, it's a little dip, but it's like, it's not, it's not that crazy. Here's a heat map of what we're looking at in the overall capital equity market. So this is what we've got S&P 500 today. Uh, as you can see, it's red, but like the, I mean, the, it, it's not like, look, Microsoft's and Apple are down 1%. Adobe is down 1.5%. Oracle is down 0.47%. Where is the like 5%, 6%, 4%? Where is the sky is falling type of, type of, um, you know, dip? Uh, not seeing that. Not seeing that at all. ETFs, all of them are red, right? They're red. Uh, inverse ones are up, but it's not, I, I'm not seeing, I'm not, I'm barely seeing anything that are, that are more than 2% down. I mean, look, where's the ones that are more than 2% down? Even the Bitcoin ones are down 1.3%, 1.2%. So again, the, the, the triple leverage ones, yeah, those are down more than 2%. But outside of that, I, I, I think this was a good CPI because we got it over with. We knew it was going to be hot. It's done. And now we can probably move on to, uh, to, to a different level. Um, uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to moving forward, because we've gobbled up a bad CPI. And so I don't, I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's that bad. What website is this FinWiz? I'll put it in the chat, FinWiz. 
It's a really good website. I, I, I've seen these screenshots for, but I never knew the website, but I think June showed me the website the other day. And so it's a very, very good website. Um, yeah, people are buying this dip. Let's see what people are saying on Twitter. What are people saying on Twitter? So I tweeted about this. Um, dude, I'm, I'm, I feel so bad that at 820, the stream was called the most important day on the history of planet Earth, which I made that title at 2 a.m., dude. I was like so sleepy. I was like, oh, what's the good title? The most important day on the history of planet Earth, blah, blah, blah. And then there were probably people waiting and I just didn't show. I feel so bad about that, dude. I really do. I, I, I you know, you guys know I, I'm not that I never, I've never missed the market open because I've overslept maybe for like five or 10 minutes, but never like 40 minutes. Um, but nonetheless, at least we're here and didn't seem like it's that bad. So what are people saying? Um, bidding negative 5%, all holdings not chased. Uh, I see Tesla pumping again, didn't hit my limit buy. Feels like they'll buy the dip. Economy looks good for now. Unless something breaks, then it's going to get painful. Yeah, that's a good comment because things, things have not broken in the economy yet, at least for now. CPI is a scam. Okay, so that's there. We can't catch a break. Oil at 90, time for bears to come. Even with oil at 90, we're not seeing the dramatic crash I think we were all looking for this morning. Was hoping for a good day to get SoFi over eight. Probably not happening today. Someone slept through the most important date in the history of the stock market. Not just the stock market, but the history of planet Earth. We got to get the title right. Uh, I'm still bullish. This is just noise to me. I agree. I think this is just a lot of noise. It's good data, but it's not data that suggests that the economy is in a very bad, very bad situation. Okay, now I know why I slept through CPI. June slept through CPI. See, June? You, you, you are in every live stream. If you sleep through it, like subconsciously, that made me sleep through it as well. So this is really June's fault. Like June, we still have two months until we get to June. Okay. So you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta chill out there, but you're in every stream. And if you didn't show up, that's, that's why I didn't show up. So I think that's the, I think that's the reason Lee Allison says we, we thought you had been kidnapped. Yeah, dude, I got a bunch of messages. That said, yo, I woke up at exactly nine. It was to a Chris phone call. And it, it, the ringer wasn't on. So I literally just naturally woke up. It wasn't even his, his uh, like phone ring, like the, the sound of the, of the phone call didn't even wake me up. And I, I answered it. I was like, yo, he was like, yo, I was like, I slept in. He was like, yeah, I can see that. I was like, all right, I'm getting on right now. <laughs> it was, and then, and then we got on, but I had a bunch of text messages of people saying, yo, like, are you okay? Like, I hope you're doing well. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm doing well. I was just. I was wrapped up in a fucking dream. That was the problem. I thought you were in a damn car crash. You never missed the stream. Yeah, dude, I've not, I haven't missed the CPI in like a year and a half now. It's the eclipse's fault. That's what it is. It's the fucking eclipse, dude. Stupid eclipse. That thing like that thing uh, messed up the space time continuum. By the way, space time continuum. I think that's a term that originated in Back to the Future. I used to say that thing all the time, dude. I think I, I heard it some time when I was a kid and I used to say it for fun. I think it originated in Back to the Future. I think that's where like it became popular, the space-time continuum. So when I was watching Back to the Future, I was like, oh, this is where that term came from that I was using that was like as a kid. Like I had no idea it came from there. I think it came from Back to the Future. At least it got popular from that uh from that movie. Tesla 172, SoFi 778, Google 157, Roblox is green, MasterCard is green, uh, Meta's green. Kathy did do some buying yesterday. She bought some pound shares, she bought 3,000 shares. Not a lot, but she did buy. Uh yesterday, uh 3,000 shares of pound shares. So that was good. And then, yeah, she bought, a, she bought a lot more Teladoc yesterday as well. She bought a lot more Teladoc. Here's one thing I want to show you guys. This is why Palantir is not falling below 20. Let me show you this post um, that I talked about on Daily Palantir yesterday. So I'm going to put this in the chat. If you haven't subscribed, dailypalantir.substack.com. Please make sure you subscribe. It's free to subscribe. Look at this part of the article that Sean published yesterday. Okay, this thing blew my mind. So in 2006, Alex Karp asked me if I knew why French restaurants were so good. I had no idea. He told me that a French restaurant, the wait staff is actually part of the kitchen staff. They intimately understand the food, the methodology and the technique. They are not merely carrying the food from the kitchen to the table, but are instead part of a subtle and complex system that affects kitchen, op kitchen operations. He wanted me to build that, but for engineering. It's so crazy that Carp kind of convinced Sham to be the CTO of Pound here in a philosophical way, right? By using freaking French restaurants as the methodology to, um, to describe why he should join pound here. And then Sham talks about how he came up with the term forward deployed engineer and all that stuff. It's a really good article. If you haven't read it, I recommend reading it. 
Um, but it was really good stuff. And that's why pound here, I think is harder to get below 22 because people are realizing that these guys are actually running a business that is philosophically and technically advanced at a higher level. Here's another thing, uh, Sham said in that article, shortly after pound here started investors and the few folks in the Valley who were into us wanted to, wanted to hire a well-known thousand X engineer at this stage of the company, we had nothing, no product, no business, no traction. We were desperately waiting, waiting for validation for our model. And the fact that this engineering God would work at Pounder was very validating. The problem was he wanted 500,000, which is about 10 million in today's dollars, and very clearly didn't value the equity or stock-based compensation we were offering. Fundamentally, he was a mercenary. To him, Pounder wasn't a calling. Not giving him the offer was so hard. Our investors weren't happy about it. But from that point forward, all salaries were capped below market, but with generous equity, we were going to be a cult. It was going to be painful to join. So applicants needed to want to be on board badly. What was really good about that from Sham's article is that everyone says, oh, Pounder investors are a cult. And you got the literal CTO saying, hey, the company itself is a cult first company. Wow, Meta at 518. It is up right now. MasterCard is up. Ro Roblox is up. S&P starting to get a little bit more into the green. 515 right now was at 512. We are seeing the market get a little bit of, uh, of, of a bounce. So, so Sham saying, hey, the company itself was started with a cult first mentality. Of course, the stock investors are going to be a cult because the very nature of the company and how it bleeds into thinking about investing in it is a cult based, um, I guess, philosophy or mission that people tend to get behind. And look, cults, cults put up the numbers, cults get the job done. So I think it was really interesting that the CTO is saying we started the company as a cult. People laugh at Pound investors for being a cult. But at the end of the day, uh, cults, cults get shit done and we get gains. And I think that's what we're seeing right now when it comes to Pound here. Open Sky says, I love the Kool-Aid. Yeah, the cult is drinking the Kool-Aid. We are drinking this Palantir Kool-Aid right now. Um, so I think this was really exciting to see what, what he said about uh, Palantir in, in those early days. Uh, Chris says, had a huge swing trade on Livongo back in 2020, and then they got bought by TDoc. Not liking TDoc yet. Something seems off with it. Does anyone know why ARK bought TDoc? I talked about this yesterday. TDoc's financials were disgusting. If you look at their last quarter numbers, their better help, which they did an acquisition of this like telehealth therapy company, that's down year over year by 4%. So they're not even growing their subscribers. Revenue is down 4% year over year. Stock-based compensation, it's okay, but like still it's not the best. I think she's buying it to just average down because at this point she's thinking that the float is 65 million shares, something like that. And at some point when rates come down, everything's going to bounce. And for her, she's like, all right, if I buy this at $14, do I think this can go to 25 when rates come down? Probably. And I think that's why she's buying it. Not the best reason to buy it. S&P right now at 516. It was at 512 to start the morning, guys. Absolutely incredible. But I think that's the reason she's buying it. I don't think there's a fundamental reason to really buy Teladoc from the research I've done. Me and Steve were going to buy it back in December. NVIDIA 871. Steve called me. We spent an hour looking at the numbers. Uh, but then we concluded, like, yeah, there's not really that much of a moat there. And so we just didn't look at it again. Uh, but she's buying the dip. Robin at 1844. Basically where it was yesterday. Nice 6% upswing from the dip at 1759. Absolutely incredible. Um, again, the dip is being bought, it seems like, in a variety of these companies. And if there is not a massive green candle, at least there is still a green candle. Like PayPal is not green today because it was at 67 yesterday, so it's still down. But look at that candle. It's still green, uh, only down 1.34% versus being down 3% to start the morning. So that's what we got on, uh, on some of these stocks that are green. You spent an hour talking about Teladoc. Yeah, dude, Steve called me. It was his idea. He's like, yo, we need to look at Teladoc. This is when Teladoc was like 21. And I was like, all right, let's look at it. Because he said the float was short and I mean, the float was small. So like there was going to be, you know, possibly a bounce. The problem is, and this is, this is what happens when you just look at the technicals. Teladoc doesn't, from my understanding, doesn't have the best moat. And people don't care that much about telehealth anymore. They actually want to see their doctor. Let's look at TDoc short float right now. And when that, the technicals can be amazing. But when that happens, when those fundamentals are that bad, it's going to be hard to get it to, to move up. Teladoc short interest is 12.64%. Uh, Teladoc short interest. So it's up to, it's about basically 2.95% over the past two weeks, up to 12.64% 12 12 of the float. Now we do have SoFi short float and Pounder short float that came out. Pounder, we saw yesterday, it's down another 0.5%. So uh, only 4% of the 2.1 billion shares sold short for Pounder, or, or billion shares in general in the float are sold short. That's really good. The people are, you know, people are just not messing with Pounder, which is great for longs because it means that if the company performs, the shorts are not weighing it down. And it's also a reason Pounder can bounce on a day like today because the shorts aren't like aggressively pulling it back down, which is a good thing. You want the shorts to just not mess with your company and let them move on. On SoFi, the short float went from 23 to 19. So it's down 18.2% over the past two weeks. 
Still aggressive. 19% is pretty high short float, but they did cover. I wouldn't be surprised if more of them took a little bit of a covering today. So if I announced two partnerships over the past couple of days, one with the National Association of Realtors and another one with Wyndham Clark. I don't know who the hell this guy is, but he's some famous golfer. And so uh, they partnered with him. That, along with Noto giving more clarity on the convertible debt offering, I think that's what's leading the shorts to maybe think about covering before we get into that into that earnings on April 29th. And we're seeing some momentum there when it comes to when it comes to SoFi. All three indices are shooting up right now. So what do we have? NVIDIA's at 870, Pound 2264, Robin at 1843. Uh, QQQ is barely down 0.74% compared to where it was. Uh, S&P. 515 down 0.68%. Again, I think the bears are, are probably really annoyed at this right now. The bears have wanted a 2% down day on the S&P over the past five months and we haven't got it. So I think the bears thought that this would be the day to get it to happen. And the market right now is saying, dude, go take a hike. Like, like we're not letting this market fall that easily. And s and is recovering a bit. Apple was down 1.3%. Now it's down 0.65%. There's a lot of money made from that 1.3 to 0.65 in the trading uh, in the trading ecosystem, people probably, you know, if you were long Apple from 167.11 to 168.49, you made some money and Apple's recovering a bit. Verizon recovering. It was down 2%, now down 0.73%. Again, PayPal 66, SoFi 778. SoFi is where it was at yesterday. Literally SoFi is where it was at yesterday. So it's not bad at all. Not bad at all what we're seeing in terms of some of this stuff. Bitcoin as well, 68.971. We got to see if Bitcoin can get back up there. Let me show you the Bitcoin inflows. I took a look at this last night. Uh, when I should have been sleeping, but I was tweeting instead. So Bitcoin inflows were bad yesterday, which is why we're also seeing a little bit of a, a decline, but it's not too bad. So Grayscale sold 154 million. Bitwise bought 3 million. Fidelity bought 3 million. BlackRock bought 128 million. So, I mean, not the best inflows, but it was enough to overcome the Grayscale selling. Um, so that's why we fell over, over the night. But still, like inflows, this is the 61st day in a row that we have had Bitcoin inflows into all the into at least fidelity and I believe BlackRock as well. Those two have had 61 days in a row of constant inflows, even if it's only three million bucks, which is pretty incredible. Pretty, 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 pretty damn incredible. Uh, you guys are making fun of how I say golf in the chat. You know what? Um, it is what it is. It is what it is. I said yesterday I was going to stand up to the propaganda machine that is dictionary.com and not let them dictate the very thoughts and uh, ideas I have around society because America is already becoming a very communist country and I'm not going to let them control me. So yeah, it's golf. It's not golf. Uh, it's, we're going to, we're going to have to say, we're going to have to say things that actually allow us to believe in our freedoms and stand up for our dreams at the end of the day. Having said that, let's go to word of the day. Okay. Let's see what we got. Okay. There's no way I get this wrong. There's no way in hell I get this wrong, dude. There's literally no way in hell I can get this wrong. Kin keeping, kin keeping. There's no way I get that wrong, right? The kin keeping, that's it. There's no kin keeping. Okay. Thank God, dude. If he were, if he was going to be like kin kapang or something like that, I would have like, literally, I would have shut down this computer and thrown it out the window. If he said. So kin keeping, kin keeping the labor involved in maintaining and enhancing family ties, including organizing social occasions, remembering holidays, sending gifts. So basically, if you remember important occasions for your loved ones, you are kin keeping. Okay, cool. Interesting word. Uh, not the most exciting word but not the craziest word either. So kin keeping, that's what we have right now. Uh, the Despite her busy schedule, she always found time for kin keeping, such as sending cards. Kin keeping became much more challenging as the family grew and spread out across different cities and countries. Well, one thing I will say about this market open is that, uh, you know, it's a very special occasion every single morning at 8.45 a.m. And, uh, I tend to try my best to kin keep the market open every day. Okay. That's what I do every single day. I kin keep the market open. I need to make sure I'm there for that market open. But on some days, the days where you stay up a little later than you should have. And on the days where you get a random text at two 34, dude, like this text was insane. I did not expect to get that last night, but we got that text last night. It, it, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you up for a little bit. So again, 
uh, this girl who I used to talk to, she sends me this audio message. Literally, she sends me like this three minute message of she saw the Vlad interview. I, I guess she somehow came across it on Twitter. I don't even think I follow her on Twitter. I didn't even know she had a Twitter. And she's like, you told me to chase my dreams four years ago and I didn't listen, but I'm so happy you're chasing yours. I heard that shit and I'm just like, well, this whole night is like now weird because now I got to talk and like I got to respond to all this shit. And so honestly, I should have slept by like 2.30. But then I get this random message at 2.34, and then obviously I'm going to stay up a little bit to respond to this shit. And this is what happens when you stay up all night. So I think the conclusion is I need to stop staying up all night so I don't have to get any of these crazy messages. And um, that way I'll be able to keep the market open every single day. In reality, dude, I could have made it. I woke up at 7.30. It's just I put my head to sleep again, and then boom, I, uh, I fell asleep again. Nonetheless, we will... We will continue to keep going and do what we got to do. Um, okay, cool. So that's it. Last look at the equity markets. We got HUD 1835, Intel 3757, ARM 126, S&P 515, Pound 2258, NVIDIA 870. NVIDIA just being a champ up 2% on the day. And then Anovix is down about 5%. S&P is up. SoFi is up. Again, not up, but it's up from the lows. Celsius recovering a little bit. And then Tesla 171, not bad at all. Robin at 1833, Pound here 2256. Again, pretty damn good recovery on Robin at Pound here and the broader SP at 515 and NVIDIA here at 869 on the day. Not bad, not bad at all uh, for this market. You know, actually, it's not that crazy that I, uh, it, it's actually. It's actually not that bad that we woke up by nine and then we got to have Chris on for an hour. And I don't know if we started because Chris was going to join at 820. I don't know if we would have had as great of a uh, a stream in terms of just getting to talk to Chris for an hour and a half because maybe we would have to leave earlier. So I think it's actually it's not the worst thing that uh, I'm just finding excuses right now to justify sleeping in. <laughs> I'm like, well, the stream actually was kind of good because Chris got to be on for like an hour and maybe he wouldn't have been on for an hour and we got to get good quality analysis from Chris. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find all the ways the universe can can use to justify um, justify me sleeping in. But no, in all seriousness, I'm sorry I slept in. I just, I just, I'm probably not going to be able to stay up all night. I'm getting older, dude. I can't stay up. I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm tw at 26, I'll be 27 in a few months. I can't do these all nighters anymore. By the way, in high school, I did all nighters all the time. Like all the time, dude. I did not sleep in high school. I would sleep at 5 a.m., wake up at 6, get on the bus. Like I was, I was a machine. Um, but now at this point, dude, if I don't sleep, like my heart starts beating, I get palpitations. I have a pl plethora of just things that'll pop up. I haven't even peed yet, dude. I haven't even peed. Like I've been holding in this bladder for the past two hours because I went straight into the stream. That's how dedicated I was to like, I was like, we're just doing the stream, fuck it. And so I need to, I need to sleep. I need to, I need to sleep during the night. We got to do that. Bro's acting like he's 85. Dude, I guess like the sleep's catching up to me at this point. I got to fucking sleep. I got to indeed sleep. Um, Guys, she's a, okay. I'm seeing your comments right now. She has a boyfriend. This is not a, one of those situations. She was a really good friend um, that I used to talk to a, a few years ago when she didn't have a boyfriend, but she, she does have a boyfriend. So it's not like that. I, some of you guys are saying gold digger and stuff like that. It's not like that. It was just a really good friend I used to talk to. Um, but I didn't expect her to message me last night. Like that was the that was the interesting thing. But she has a boyfriend. It's not, it's not like that at all. Um, and I'm really happy for her. She just went to Paris with her boyfriend. Like she's like she's living her life. But she was up late as well, and so she sent that message. I guess because she was like just really she like I'm genuinely happy for her and what she's doing because she's like we don't talk that much, but she's a really good friend. And I think she saw the Vlad interview on Twitter, and uh, she hadn't you know talked to me in a while, and so she saw that and she was just like holy crap like. Basically, the, jux of the crux of the message was in 2020 when we started getting closer, you know, I was this kid who just graduated college. I think she had two years left in college. And the whole idea was like, yo, chase your dreams. Like, you know, like really do what you want to do in life. And we were having all these philosophical discussions and shit. And um, she she didn't she didn't take that route. She went the corporate route. And uh, I never went the corporate route. Right. And she saw me for the past couple of years struggle and build my own shit and start things and idea and all this stuff like she saw all of that. And so I guess last night it kind of hit her just like, yo, I want to send him a message just saying like, hey, congrats on like just sticking to it because um, because she chose not to do it. It was kind of a little bit of a depressing message at the end, because at the end. At the end, she was just like, I really wish I had followed your advice because now like I have a stable life, but like I've I'm kind of like scared that my life doesn't have any meaning. 
And that shit hit me. Th that's also why it had me staying up. Dude, you guys think I stayed up because like, oh my God, this girl sent me an audio message. Like, it's not about the girl. Like, that, the girl is whatever. But again, she has a boyfriend. It's not about that. It's about the message she sent. And the message kind of hit me in the fucking, in the face. It was just like, oh shit. Like, there was a world, there was a path that could have gone down in 2020 that was not chasing my dreams, right? That was not doing what I wanted to do. And although I don't think I'm necessarily there yet, the past four months have been pretty damn surreal just in, 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 in terms of like what's happened in, in my life. And it, it, the message hit me because you're li it's like when you talk to an old people, right? And they say they have a ton of regrets before they die and you know they're about to die. And so they, they don't have time to, uh, to solve those regrets because they're going to fucking die. That's how she was talking, even though she's like 25, right? So it's not, it's like she was being more serious than I think she needed to be. Uh, but at 25, I think you're getting closer to 30 and the shit started hitting her like, holy crap, like, like you know, I'm not really doing what I want to do in life. And it hit me because I was like, damn, the past four years, I've been fucking struggling to try to get to the point where, you know, 1500 people show up on the live stream and we can actually have a good time and really get my thoughts and ideas out there and build this media brand. And I'm in the midst of, I'm in the eye of that fucking hurricane right now, just pummeling through. And the hurricane has a lot of momentum. And it just gave me a lot of perspective. Like there are people that didn't go that route that I grew up with and they were having some regrets about it, you know? And, uh, and, 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 and and that that that's what hit me. That's what kept me up a little bit because I was just thinking about that. And then unfortunately, that kept me up enough to to not wake up early. Uh, girl is in Paris and she's depressed. Tell her to kick, kick rocks. Well, dude, that's the thing, dude. You can go to Paris with your boyfriend, right? Which she she just got back from Paris with her boyfriend, and still feel like your life has no meaning. And I was trying to tell her, I was like, dude, like you should. I mean, you, you know, even though you're not like quote unquote chasing your dreams, you're you're going to fucking Paris with your love of your life. Like that's like an amazing thing. That's incredible. Like you should be so happy. Like that that's part of your life. But still, there's this thing from a selfish, uh, individualistic perspective. This is the the concept of the sovereignty of the individual. Like if you're not if you're not uh, going after your own individual pursuits of happiness and destiny, sometimes the love, sometimes the money, sometimes the stable career, all of that stuff maybe is not enough to really get at the arc of what you truly desire in life and i think she's having a little bit of that realization she has a great job boyfriend you know stable income all that shit but she's not doing what she wants to do you know and um it can hit you sometimes as you get older you're kind of just like you know now granted she's young i think she has plenty of time so that's the other thing i told her i was like dude if you want to build something you know you have time but the amount of commitment it takes to actually build something in the content media like she wants to do content as well she has art and shit she wants to put out there I didn't even give advice on how to get started because in my head, I don't know how to give people advice anymore. It is so difficult. It is so fucking difficult to like actually do this. Forget for a living, but just in a way that's somewhat like growing, right? Forget making money, but like actually like building, like it's actually, you can see the numbers start to, like it is so hard. I don't even know how to give anybody advice. If someone paid me for consulting, I don't even know how to consult them. Like this shit is just raw. You got to get in there and just be a fucking maniac and make this thing happen. And so I think she's kind of, you know, feeling that. She didn't go, she didn't go that route. Um, but, but yeah, that's why the message hit me a, a little bit deeper. Someone says she wanted the Robin Hood DD. Ironically, in 2020, when we started talking, I, I, I told her to make her, dude, this is the world is just full circle. Dude. I was like, I, 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 I helped her set up her first Robin Hood account. Like I helped her get into investing back in 2020. Uh, now she didn't care anymore about investing. Like we talked about it for like a couple months and then she, she just, she, she, she stopped caring about it that much. But like, I remember I set, I helped her set up her first Robinhood account. And I think that's what also hit her. She was like, yo, you helped me like get into Robinhood and now you're interviewing the Robinhood CEO. It's kind of crazy. And I was just like, yeah, that is kind of, that is kind of wild. That is kind of, kind of crazy. So that's why the message hit me last night. It wasn't about the girl. It was about welcome to a Mitz TED Talk. Shout out to my boy, Jose. We'll be on Chip Chat tomorrow, Thursday, 1 p.m. We'll be talking about um, we'll be talking about Intel and this new NVIDIA competitor that I think Jose's laughing at because it's probably not a real NVIDIA competitor. At least the market doesn't think that yet. Um, but yeah, we'll be talking to him tomorrow. He just hit 40,000 subs on YouTube. If you're not sub subscribed to Jose Naharo Stocks, type in Jose NVIDIA. He'll pop up. He's the first video that'll be there. And uh, this is, if you want semiconductor coverage, you got to go to this channel. Just absolute, absolute amazing coverage on the semi. So he just hit 40K. And Jose knows, oh, Google Chips. We got to talk about Google Chips as well. Yeah. Jose knows how hard it is to build content, dude. And Jose has a wife. He has a, he has a kid as well. So he knows this game when it comes to content is fucking ruthless. It's not easy. And so that's why the message hit me last night. It really wasn't about, it wasn't about the girl. It was more so about like the message she sent. And, uh, yeah, it's like, dude, I hadn't heard her voice in like a year and a half. So also when I, when I when you get hit with an audio message, you're just like, oh shit, like, you know, you haven't heard that person in so long. 
but yeah that's what uh that's what that's what kept me up so yo look how obnoxious i was being dude i was like you thought by 12 30 i would have called it quits didn't you i'm up and working don't need no red bull hour later update it's 1 30 still working cpi in seven hours nothing is stopping me <laughs> from achieving my destiny <laughs> of being awake tonight and then i use the fucking show goes on meme dude it was so obnoxious it was so obnoxious last night i was just like you guys can't stay up but i'm a different breed i can stay up 10 hours and do a morning open live stream none of you guys are gonna stop me and then 2 30 i get this fucking message from this girl and then look, look at this at, at four, at four, at six 38. See, I was awake update. I fell asleep at 4 AM, but I'm up now. It's time for CPI. And then at six 38, I, um, I decided to, to go to sleep. So that's, uh, that's, that's what we had. <laughs> so yeah, dude, I really wanted to pull this off. Cause I was going to be, I was ready to come on live and be like, guys, I've been up for 10,000 years, but I'm here ready to do the CPI. And I, and, and, and I actually thought CPI, I, I was wrong on CPI. I thought it would be colder than expected. Granted the dip has been bought. So even if it was hot, it's not that crazy, but I did think it would be a good CPI. So it's kind of wild. Cause as soon as I woke up, I didn't even check the market. Like literally I checked the market at 9 AM with you guys on the live stream for the first time. I like looked at what the market was at and, um, it surprised me. I did not think it would be this hot, but market seems to be buying a bit of that dip. I did three days without sleeping during college. I did the same. I, when I was rushing my fraternity, I did a solid three to four days of the last couple days of rushing where, I mean, dude, it was, it was hell on earth, but like I stayed awake. I got the job done. This was back in 2018. Um, but like, I don't, I can't do that anymore, dude. I just can't. Like I, I feel my heart palpitating. I don't even know what palpitate means, but I know that means that your heart hurts. And oh, by the way, my, my tax guy sent me my tax bill yesterday, my accountant. This is when the market was taking a little bit of a dump early in the morning at 1030. And he's like, hey, you owe XYZ in taxes. And I was like, okay, so now I got to pay these fucking taxes. So yesterday, just had a bunch of shit happen. And I ran, I went to the gym. I, I, I ran, even though I don't live in the Middle East. And I actually, you know, I put in some work. And so all that, you know, strain on my body, mentally and physically, I guess, got me to, uh, to not be able to wake up early. So it is what it is. It is what it is, but we're here and uh, we're going to keep going. Minutes are at 11 a.m. Okay, cool. So we'll get those minutes. I'll cover those during the market close. We'll see what the Fed had to say. Those minutes, by the way, well, actually, let's wait till 11 a.m. We're not, well, we won't read the minutes. I'll, I'll read them more in depth, but let's see. Let's wait two minutes. Let's see how the market reacts. Because once those minutes come out, if the algorithms track that the Fed said something a little scary, then we might get a little bit of a dip. So let's see in two minutes what these, what the market looks like. Um, and we'll see what goes from there. Ichi says those were scheduled tweets. Those were not scheduled tweets, dude. I was, I was, I was awake. I was awake. I was working. I was getting shit done. <sighs> and then I fell asleep. But at least I was, uh, at least I was here by 9 a.m., dude. It could have been worse. It could have been like 9 15, 9 30. It could have been much worse. At least it was only 9 a.m. Technically, it would have only been 15 minutes. Yo, technically, it would have only been 15 minutes late on a regular market open day starting at 845. But because of the damn CPI, it was 40 minutes late. And because the freaking stream, the worst part is the stream was scheduled, dude. The stream was scheduled. So if the stream wasn't scheduled, it would I wouldn't have felt that bad that people were literally waiting, just like waiting there. But I scheduled the thing at 3 a.m. because I was like, oh, let me schedule it because I'm going to be up all night. And then if it's scheduled, people are there in the chat and they're waiting. And, um, and yeah, we ended up being 40 minutes late. Um, but it's okay. We are here. So lunch with them in, uh, we're going to start lunch with them in, in a few weeks, guys. I, I, just, I need to get so much shit together. I'm just, I have so much shit I have to do getting it together, but we will, we will start lunch with them in relatively soon. If not next week, then in a week from now, but we will, we will start it pretty soon. Okay. We got a minute until these minutes come out. Let's see. Let's see how bad the market reacts. Um, also, my title was obnoxious too, dude. I usually don't do clickbait, but I thought this was, be I, I didn't think this was clickbait. I thought this was actually you know, the most important day in the history of planet earth. I thought legitimately this, this day was going to matter, but it was a nothing burger, dude. We got a hot CPI and the market doesn't care. Like it's, I thought it was going to be a really important day and it was, but like, Again, we're seeing a lot of red, but that red is relatively small compared to what we had in the pre-market. The market didn't care. 
The market did not care. Robin at 1830, Pound 2252, NVIDIA 865. Okay, minutes are out. So let's just look at the market for another minute or two and see what happens. Uh, s and is down a little bit more, 514. We're getting some red candles. Those minutes, if they indicated that the Fed is um, hawkish on the CPI report, then that also might be another reason. Well, actually, let me pull up CNBC. Let's CNBC covering this. They have the actual minutes. Let's see. Because if they are a bit hawkish, maybe maybe that might hit the market a little bit. Um, Joe Biden is speaking right now with the Prime Minister of Japan. Okay, so that's happening. Where is the market? Are we down? Okay, s and is down 1%. Pounder's down again. Robin is down a little bit. So market's dipping. So the, the minutes are probably not the best, but it's not like <clears throat> it's not like it was in the pre-markets. Apple's down. Amazon's down. Snowflake's down. S&P is down. Yeah, but it's not 512 on the S&P. It's still 514. It's not as down as it is right now. Minutes are at two. Wait, are the minutes at two? Oh, someone who said 11, they might be in California. Oh, so maybe we don't have the minutes. Maybe we don't have the minutes. Yeah, I think the person who said the minutes are at 11, you might be in California. So for you, it's eight o'clock right now, which is why 11 is three hours. For me, it's literally at 11. Max Deuce. Max, are you in California? Did you mess up our 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 time zone right now? The, the Fed minutes usually do come out at 2 p.m., right? They don't come out at 11. They usually come out at 2. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, they come out. Hold on. What's today? Today's April 10th? Yeah, dude, they come out at 2 p.m. They don't come out at 11. Look at this. They come out at 2 p.m. So this is what happens when these West Coast, best coast people get in the chat and start putting their 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 time zones in. So yeah, it's 2 p.m. So we'll cover it on the market closed. We'll see these minutes. So 2 p.m., keep an eye out for 2 p.m. If the market dips at 2 p.m., it's because the Fed said some nasty stuff about CPI. If the market goes higher at 2 p.m., the Fed is more dovish on CPI and overall inflation. So keep a look at 2 p.m. Definitely keep a look at 2 p.m. All right. That's it for me. I'll see you guys at 345. Uh, I will not be late for the market close. Not going to take a nap or anything like that. And uh, yeah, we'll see how this market turns out. So far, if you just joined, headline CPI 3.5, core 3.8 wasn't the best. Market's eating up that dip like a freaking champ because I think we know AI is real. We know that inflation is coming down. And if that's the case, um, market's ready to continue to buy the dip. And that's what we got right now. Collapses amid is getting the time all wrong today. Dude, it's, it's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I've learned my lesson. I'm not staying awake all night anymore. I'm not pulling any all nighters. You know what? I, I will I will sleep early and I will wake up early if I have to get work done. I did get a lot of work done last night, by the way. I had a lot of shit I had to catch up on. I got all of it done. So it was a productive night. It's just some I think by like 2 a.m. I gotta call it quits. Like sleeping at 4 or 5 a.m. It's not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna keep going. I mean, what was your major? I was a business major, like business management in college. So <laughs> 345, not 420. Benny, I hate you. Yes, 345, not 420. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. All right. This was fun. Thank you, everybody, for still being here and joining. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mid, but we know you're going to bed right now. No, I'm actually not going to bed because, because those extra 40 minutes I got of sleep when I should have been awake doing the market open, uh, I'm good to go. I'm energized. I'm literally not sleepy. I'm going to Dunkin' Donuts. I'm going to get a caramel latte. You know what's so ironic yesterday, too, on fucking Twitter? What I said on Twitter is I said, if we come in, if we come in cold on CPI, it'll wake me up better than any caramel latte could ever do for me. Um, and ironically now, not only does the CPI not wake me up, I'm actually getting a caramel latte to wake up right now. So that's, that's, that's what we got going on. But also I got more work to finish and I still have to run. Uh, I still have to keep up my third day of going to the gym in a row. I already, I'm already down three pounds, dude. I'm already now look, I know it's water weight. I know that's not real, but the point is I like seeing progress. I'm a guy that has to see progress. And when you go down three pounds, uh, even if it's just water weight to me, that's very encouraging. And that the psychology of, all right, let, let's stay consistent. Let's not fuck this up. Don't go eat some bad shit. Keep going, keep running. Uh, we're going to keep this thing moving and we're going to get down to 145 pounds by the end of July. We're going to keep, we're going to keep doing this 300 calories in this caramel latte. Actually it's 250. Okay. I calculate my care, my, my care, uh, my calories. Uh, but now I'm also doing one meal a day so I can afford those calories given I will have a, a deficit later in the day. All right. That's it. Yo, I really have to pee. 
in the chat. <laughs> like, go pee, dude. I'm good at holding my bladder. I have not peed for a good three hours right now. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna go do that, and then, and then we'll keep going from there. We'll see how this market turns out. Two p.m. Keep an eye on that, and then market close. We'll see what happens from there. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> it is going to fall asleep in the sauna today. <laughs> I'll see you guys at 3.45 p.m. Bye, everyone. See you then.